Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome to Mind Heist episode 83. Um, I guess we start the episode, uh, kind of introduce uh, what this episode is about because it's kind of a follow on from the last episode, episode 82. And um, so last episode we talked about, it was actually a mixture of things really, Muhammad, wasn't it? It's like, I think we mixed up a lot of things together and maybe that caused a bit of an issue because it's hard to be clear because we, we mixed actually racism we mix that with black lives matter we mix that with islamophobia we mix that with you know living in the uk as a minority and all that so th there was a lot we covered but um from that uh conversation um there was some feedback some positive some negative so we want to kind of uh, as we did i think when we talked about like feminism and stuff we want to like deal with some of the feedback people give us on this episode and we also brought sharif on who was with us on episode 79 i believe uh, to, to kind of uh, weigh in as well, see uh, if he has any other perspectives and anything, any unique insights, especially considering he's uh, born and raised in the US as well. And, um, and yeah, so Sharif, you know, when I, uh, I invited you on, I didn't know, to be honest, if you would agree with what we said in that episode or not. Uh, and I just thought, mm -hmm. even if he completely disagrees, let's bring him on because um, like we said in the end of the last episode, like, uh, I, I don't have so much experience, obviously, in the US, and I don't have experience when it comes to racism. So I could very well be wrong here. But come, come with your your feedback, and let's see, you know, what what you have to say. Basically, uh, anyone listening who, if they agree or disagree, or want to add points. Um, so when I asked you to come on, I I wasn't, I didn't know if you would agree or disagree. But I thought even if you really disagree, that would be actually maybe better and healthier. Um, but unfortunately, you told me that you kind of listened to it and you agreed with most of it or all of it or whatever. So uh, nonetheless, I'm sure you can add more, inshallah. So um, I want to start actually by asking you a question because some of the uh, people critiquing last episode, they said that the, the general uh, idea or feeling was that, you know, Muhammad and I, we can't really address this topic accurately because we're not black. And uh, I kind of understand that in terms of we might have missing information in terms of the context or the experience of uh, black people, whether it's in the US or elsewhere. Um, however, like facts and opinions don't have a race, right? So like no matter what we said, either it's wrong or it's right. Now we could be wrong because we're missing information, in which case, you know, I'm, I'm kind of happy to be proven wrong there. Uh, but what do you think about this idea that you know, we can't speak uh, about this problem or this topic uh, because we're not black. Well, um, I think it's ridiculous. True that you're going to be missing some of the information, um, the experiences, and um, even living in the country. Mm -hmm. But to say that you can't speak about the issue is completely wrong. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps you have friends, relatives, uh, co-workers, who are in this situation and they've told you about their experiences. So yeah. this will give you some insight, but mm. to totally dismiss you, um, I think that's uh, wrong. Mm. Right. I think, I think what, what, what's also important to see, which is what I found fascinating is that a lot of the, it was a vocal minority, I believe, because not that many people will comment if the episode's great. Yeah. Yeah. But then if it's, if there's an issue, then people will jump on. But there was discrepancy. Uh, although these people presented themselves as if they spoke for all black people in their comments. So, like, so there was a lot of comments like, oh, you need to do this for black people. You need to apologize for all black people. There was a discrepancy between the comments. For example, there was one person who spoke about the use of the N-word. Right? We'll get onto that later. But the use of the N-word, saying how abhorrent it is, how despicable it is, mm. and how dare we even suggest that there is a, a spectrum of usage there. However, the second critique underneath it was somebody with the N-word in their username. And I just found that fascinating because I thought these are opinions. Uh, the opinion of, a, of, of black individuals are, is a spectrum. They're, people, they, they're not all the same. So you cannot invalidate the opinion of, a, of a, a black individual who may agree with us or who may, because I, I said a lot of the points that we mentioned were from, from uh, black brothers and sisters I saw on, on social media. For example, the critique of the Black Lives Matter organization, a lot of that information was, was sent to me from um, black brothers and sisters. Do you understand? So 
I think it. I think I don't. I don't know why there was this sort of uh, angry monolithic sort of. This is the way we feel. Forgetting yeah. that there's a spectrum of opinion within the the, the you know that community, mm. regardless. So yeah, yeah, and it. I mean, like I said, I understand if we're missing information. That's fine. Like, uh, I, I you know we could be missing information on many topics, um, but you know, opinions don't have races and facts don't have races. So, and to say that I'm wrong because I'm not black, you know, that sounds racist to me, right? So uh, uh, anyway, that's that point. But you know, one thing that I think we, maybe uh, we were naive about Muhammad is that maybe how uh, sensitive the topic is uh, mm. and how, you know, there's, there's really a lot of uh, emotion tied up uh, in the topic, right? So maybe, uh, I was naive about that. Maybe we should have started with some uh, things. Uh, maybe we, we thought we were we naively thought that people would assume the best of us, and people know that as Muslims, we we don't really uh, obviously we're anti-racism. But the comments yeah. that I was seeing, the negative ones, it was like they thought we were we were pro, right? Yeah. Um, but what I think we were trying to do is say, look, uh, the mainstream kind of view it's trying to achieve. Uh, you know, uh, the end of racism, you could say. And we also want to achieve that, but it's just the means by which we, we go there um, mm. might be different. That, that's I really think, what we're trying that, to say. I think what people wanted to hear mm. was already mentioned in episode seven. Exactly, yes, exactly. If you, yeah. if anybody, you know, if the, the, the comments that were, I think, because we, we speak as if we've always, we've had the same set of listeners. And I think what's happened is mm. we've already spoken about this initially in episode 77, mm. where I pretty much regurgitated the mainstream narrative mm. that there's an, there's an issue with police brutality. There's an issue with racism within, you know, law enforcement. Um, as, as somebody who's works in law enforcement, I, I clearly stated that I found it absolutely. Um, I just couldn't fathom it. How, the brutality that we see coming out of the US even exists to the, to the extent that it does. I just couldn't fathom it based on, you know, that my day to day understanding of, of how the, the, yeah. the, the job works. I just didn't understand mm. how that can even happen, how that even gets to that point. Yeah. Um, and I, 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 you know, I, I even held my hands up feeling guilty despite the fact that I haven't actually done anything in the sense, mm. I was like, I can't, I, I feel guilty being part of a, an organization. Yeah, you did say that. Yeah. Do, you, do you know what I mean? So mm. if, if, if people want to listen to it like that, so go from 77 to the last episode, which we'll put mm. back up. And the only yeah. reason I, I would say that we, one of the main reasons we took it down was because we have to pause. Like we hit pause on things and like, okay, let's, mm. let's listen back to this. Did we do something? Yeah. Uh, you know what I mean? We have to yeah. reassess what we do. We have to judge yeah. our actions because you can't be like 80 or hundred episodes in and not make mm. mistakes. You know of what I mean? Course, of course, yeah. Yeah. However, you know, um, I think to have a, an outsider's perspective, you know, outside of mind ice, at least, um, uh, brother Sharif, who's in the U S and, and when we put it to you, you were, I mean, Tommy, you're quite passionate about this sort of subject matter anyway. Um, just to give us a bit more sort of, you know, an external viewpoint from mind ties from us too, at least, because we just, we can talk for hours, can't we? And not really, uh, <laughs> not really know, <laughs> not really know how far we're going. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you Sharif, because this is, this is what I, I was thinking that, um, I listened to the episode myself, you know, afterwards and, uh, I, I couldn't say after listening to it that there was really anything wrong with it. Now, um, I, I, of course, uh, yeah, one thing I wanted to say is that uh, what I would like Mind Heist to be about is, inshallah, trying to be a model for uh, taking on feedback and accepting like when we're wrong, right? So that's right. why at the end of every episode, we say, you know, send your comments, your feedback, your suggestions to the email address. And, uh, and that's the case here where we're going to go, inshallah, through the criticisms. And uh, we, could be, we could very well be wrong. And it's very difficult sometimes to admit you're wrong, especially when you talk about something with passion. Uh, but inshallah, we'll try and, and be a model for that and be a model for disagreement as well. Even if, you know, uh, I, don't, I still don't agree with the criticisms, um, that it's, it, we can disagree, you know, it's, it's okay. Uh, but what I wanted to ask you, Sharif, because um, these people critiquing, I'm, I'm guessing they're younger people. And uh, okay. you're somebody, uh, I'm, I think you're senior to me, right? I'm pretty sure. 
um, unless you start having a, a kids, mashallah, very young age. <laughs> um, and I wanted to ask you, like, do you think maybe the difference between some of the people critiquing their uh, opinions and uh, yours or mine, do you think it's a difference in generation rather than, okay, you're black, so you have that opinion, you're not black, so you have that opinion? Do you think it's like a generational thing? Well, I believe it's a generational thing and it's a black thing and I'll explain. So I'm 50 years old. Okay. And how I grew up and how kids are growing up today, totally different. You know, they have social media. We didn't have social media. We had fights on the playground mm. and we had to resolve it the next day. So we had conflict resolution where today's kids They've removed recess in American schools because of high state testing. So kids don't get that chance to let off steam. And if they fight to resolve these issues today, we have a culture where kids just like dislike. Uh, it's just very, very different. Yeah. And when they see something, they just speak out with actually thinking about what is going to happen later. Now, some of the youth, they're very good thinkers. I'm not going to just make a blanket statement and say all of them are like that. Mm -hmm. But from my experience, the majority of the younger people mm -hmm. act like that. Mm -hmm. uh, my nephew, <laughs> my own children, they're just quick to react. And I actually have to sit my children down and be like, no, mm -hmm. why? Mm -hmm. Okay, think about it. Why are you saying that? And they give me an answer. Then I give them another point and then they start to think. So today's youth are very quick to react, um, but I think they'd be better off uh, taking a little bit more time and thinking about things. Mm -hmm. The second point is uh, black people. And we have to look at the difference between the immigrant black population mm. and the native black population. Mm. So those who are African-American descendants of former slaves or some people are descendants of Africans that were free in America mm. have a different perspective than say, for example, the uh, Somalis who've come to America. Mm -hmm. And I have Somali brothers who've told me their life is totally different. Uh, one, in fact, the principal at his school said, and he's a teacher there, um, I'd like you to introduce yourself and talk about your experiences. So the principal said, you know, coming from a black man's point of view, and he spoke. Yeah. Well, this brother is not black in the sense as in culture. Yeah. So his black experience is different. Mm. Where some of the uh, immigrants who come from African countries, predominantly black countries, said that they didn't realize that they were black mm. because everybody in their community was black. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Experience uh, racism growing up. But when they got here, it was a little bit different mm -hmm. and they didn't recognize it as racism right away. They thought maybe it was because of their immigration status or their mm -hmm. language. Their, their, yeah. Yes. Their lack of, you know, uh, English. Mm -hmm. So we have many different experiences um, and it's really confusing. This whole Black Lives Matter thing is confusing, especially for the youth, because mm -hmm. There's a lot of action and videos and things happening. So they're just caught up in the moment. Mm. Um, not to say that their hearts are in the wrong place, but mm -hmm. it's a lot of outside forces, you know, coming in at them. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, uh, even though I guess I'm much younger than you, but I actually aspire to have what I would call the old school mindset where it's kind of like just, uh, you know, uh, challenges are coming at you and it's like, okay, let me just deal with it, right? Whereas I think um, maybe people my age and a little younger than me, uh, you know, especially in the US, I think for some reason there has been this training where it's like when things are wrong, uh, done wrong to you, instead of dealing with it, whether it's defending yourself or um, strengthening yourself so you can deal with it, the immediate reaction is to actually go and seek uh, an authority's help to deal with it, you know? So it's like uh, maybe the example of on the playground, uh, you're getting bullied. The one way is to fight back or the other ways to go tell the teacher, isn't it? Um, so anyway, I, I try to, to take on those, what I would call the old school way of thinking and doing things. I think that's just better. It's better to be strong 
uh, rather than rely on strong people to help you and you stay weak, you know? And uh, by the way, Sharif, uh, this is not an interview with you. So just butt in whenever you like and just come in basically. I don't want you to feel like, oh, I'm going to wait till I ask, uh, I'm asked a question, right? So, I got the um, job. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Um, uh, and I think we can just go into some of these uh, critiques. But before we go into that, I think I wanted to clarify because I think some clarifications need to be made just so uh, the message is understood, right? Like people don't have to accept um, what I'm say saying or agree with it, but I just want them to at least understand what I'm saying in the correct way, right? So mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the uh, Black Lives uh, Matter organization, uh, what we didn't do, Muhammad, is we didn't like uh, go through, for example, their about page on what they believe in and read some of those things out, right? Um, but if anyone did, Yanni, I think you would uh, see it's uh, the actual organization is problematic. Um, and I think, Sherif, you had some insights on that that I didn't uh, know about, like the specifics of, if you want to share that as well. Yeah, there's a lot of controversy um, because of uh, lack of transparency. Oh. So, for example, people are donating money mm. and they're not sure where their money is going to. Mm. Now, a lot of speculation saying that the money is going to the Democratic Party, oh, which really? is traditionally, mm. and I use that term loosely, uh, the Black People's Party. Mm. But historically, it's the other way around. The Republican Party was the Black People's Party. Mm. So um, even statements by like uh, Joe Biden, basically, he said, if you don't vote uh, for him, then you're not really Black. Yeah. So you have politicians making statements like that, basically, you know, checking your blackness. So one of the controversies is where is the money going? Um, people want to know. Mm. Uh, I'm going to just give you something a little similar. Um, I'm a member of the NRA. I know in the UK, you guys don't, you know, have guns, but we're a gun culture and I live in an open carry state. So I'm a lifetime member of the NRA. Mm. And I have issues with where the money goes. Mm. So I'm not making any contributions mm. anymore because I needed to be clear that my money is going to this particular cause or this particular cause. Mm. Um, so that's one thing. Um, another controversy is the establishment of the organization and what their true purpose is. Mm. Now, um, they say that they're for black lives, you know, all over the world. And I mean, we see that they're doing this. However, they have other agendas. Now, the other agendas, being their uh, homosexual and transgender agenda, doesn't discredit the Black Lives, mm. you know, agenda for mm. racial justice. justice. Mm. But somebody who is going to support this organization, they might say, well, you know, I, I don't agree with this, you know, lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And I don't want my money going to this to further some cause that I don't agree with. Yeah. Um, so transparency is definitely needed so you can know what's happening. Mm. Um, but they do say, and a lot of people say, well, why is it gotta be black lives? Why not all lives? They do clearly say that mm. they believe that all lives matter. However, at this particular time, yeah. black people are disproportionately targeted and killed. Yeah. So you gotta draw attention to the problem at hand. Mm. Would you agree with that? What's that? The disproportionately targeted? No, that, that like, uh, like, you know, uh, there's a lot of uh, pushback uh, from, you know, uh, when people say all lives matter. Um, and personally, what you said, I agree with that. Uh, yes, all lives matter, but because uh, black lives have been so um, unvalued, if you like, and, uh, and stuff, we need to focus on that, especially in the US. Oh yes, definitely. I mean, there's a lot of little videos that came out. I don't know if you saw one. Mm. Um, there's a, a young lady, she's there, the fire department's coming and there's a house on fire and they're gonna put that fire out. Mm. And she's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I need you to wet my house too. And they're like, <laughs> that house is on fire. She's like, but my house matters too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, they're showing you the difference there of that the Black Lives Matter is that house is on fire. Mm. And we need to put that fire out. Yes, yes. All, house, all houses matter, but we're not going to spray the whole neighborhood down when one particular house is on fire. So let's address this issue 
and then we can work on yeah. all the other issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so me personally, I wouldn't be very comfortable supporting the organization. Um, but like I clarified, uh, I agree, of course, with working to to end um, injustice uh, when it comes to that. You know, I just want to be clear on that in case you know people want to question that. Um, so, uh, what I wanted to do now is go into uh, one of the, we got a nice long email from somebody, um, on this. So, uh, <laughs> you gotta bear with me cause I'm going to have to read a lot here. Yeah. But, um, inshallah after the, the intro, then there's like point by point. So we could just go through that inshallah. So, uh, the sister says, Bismillah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, wa barakatuh. Uh, feedback try to make it concise forgive me so she says no one is accusing you both of being racist but the discussion was most definitely racist and very hurtful that might be very uncomfortable to hear but reflect listen and learn because what you have to understand is that we have all been affected by white supremacy and racist systems and therefore we can fall into doing or saying racist things and that it is not enough to just not be racist which we both know, uh, we know both of you clearly aren't, barakallahu uh, feekum. But you also need to unlearn all the prejudice and biases we have been fed to be anti-racist. This is not a new concept. Our deen is the perfect solution to all race problems, alhamdulillah. The deen is perfect, but Muslims are not. Please listen to the feedback and comments you received. Try to comprehend it and not be dismissive. I've listened to your podcast for a while and have learned so much, barakallahu feekum. So that's good. It's good that, that she's actually a listener because uh, I think that makes a difference. Uh, because uh, one thing I was thinking is that when we tackled this topic um, of racism or Black Lives Matter, whatever you want to call it, um, we actually, when, I'm, when I was thinking about it, I was thinking, if you listen to our, uh, any other episodes, when we talked about Islamophobia, for example, um, we're actually applying our usual principles of thinking that me and Muhammad just happen to have these ways of thinking. And we're actually applying it to, to this same thing. So inshallah, even if we're, we're wrong, we are um, being uh, consistent in our thinking, right? So I just wanted to say that. Uh, then she says, uh, 100%, definitely no one is saying you can't speak on these issues or that you can't critique the methods used or agendas that are trying to infiltrate the struggle of black people. However, just to clarify, this does not justify the deaths of anyone unjustly who is homosexual slash trans as every life is precious in Islam. But yes, both of you made very valid critiques, Barakallahu Fikum, but it's just the main focus of the whole podcast was about counter arguments. Uh, why? Because black people have been so effectively uh, dehumanized around the world so much that the bar is set so high for black people's oppression to be highlighted and acknowledged that whenever the plight of black people is brought up everyone who's not black wants to interject with counter arguments and redirect the conversation to their own experiences and needs again because the bar is set so high okay, well let me so, let me stop you there for one second yeah go ahead so let's go back to the the first part about the prejudice and biases yeah yeah um i believe everybody has prejudice and prejudices and biases. Uh, for example, when I lived abroad, mm. I gravitated towards Americans mm. first because I'm American. Yeah. Then the second group is, were British. Mm. Okay. Um, these are the people that I feel comfortable around. Mm. And it, it's not that I disliked anybody else, mm. but we share a common language, mm. uh, a similar culture. I'm not going to say it's the same because it's similar. <laughs> um, so the same thing with, um, you know, black people, mm. you know, there's going to be a bond that is there that's similar, mm. but at the same time, there's also going to be differences. You're going to have somebody who grew up in the city and their experience is one thing. And those that grew up in the country, they have a different experience yeah. mm. and they can be the same exact race. Mm. Um, I didn't. Uh, experience a lot of black people other than my relatives until I went to uh, junior high school, which is sixth grade, which um, basically 13 years old. Okay, secondary school. Uh, I grew up in a very mixed uh, neighborhood mm -hmm. where the people that lived in front of me were Puerto Rican. The people to the left of me, they were Jewish, the people right next to me on the left uh, was a police officer, black police officer. And down the road was a, a reverend, a black reverend. His wife was a school teacher. To the right of me was an 
an older couple who actually had another child later in life. We thought that was their grandkid, but it was their mm-hmm. own child. Okay. And then the the ladies who we thought were roommates was a lesbian couple. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then further down the street, a Jewish couple that were pharmacists. So I had a lot of different people, uh, you know, races and religions in my life. Mm-hmm. And then when I got to middle school, it was the first time, because it was in the city, that there were a lot of black people. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't easy to relate to them. So mm-hmm. I was more comfortable relating to my Puerto Rican neighbor mm-hmm. or even my white neighbor than the black kids in my school. Mm-hmm. So we all had prejudice. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's just basically our life experience. Yeah. So yeah. sometimes uh, people misunderstand yeah. prejudices and biases. Yeah, I guess uh, bias or, or preference or things like this, um, very natural, it's never going to go away, right? Uh, but as Muslims, what we have to do is make sure that we're not uh, oppressing people or uh, no. mistreating people um, based on some of these uh, assumptions. Really, that's what, our, what bias is, is most of the time, isn't it? It's an assumption that oh, you are from this place, so therefore you're like this, so therefore I'm going to treat you a bad way, isn't it? That's really what we have to look out for, is any mistreatment uh, because of those assumptions. Um, Okay, so next she says, I will now mention and try to explain the offensive points all mentioned in the podcast episode. So I thought this was interesting. Now, I'm not trying to, you know, focus too much on the exact words used, but um, she says, I'll try and mention and try to explain the offensive points. So for me, I just wanted to make clear that there will be a difference between uh, inaccurate, incorrect things and offensive things. Sometimes an offensive thing will be right and, and sometimes an offensive thing will be wrong, right? But we shouldn't say that they're the same thing. Like just because you're offended, it must be wrong, okay? Um, mm-hmm. I, I'm not trying to be insulting, but for the sake of making it easier for you, for you and all non-black Muslims to understand why it was so hurtful and dismissive, Next to where I state black or Black Lives Matter movement, I'll put in brackets Palestinian or Palestinian Lives Matter. Um, Why do I do this? Because the bar is set so high for the black plight to be acknowledged, let alone empathized with. So again, I'm just struggling to understand uh, how... I need to to jump in there because this kept happening. This this thing about, okay, let's replace it with Palestinian and use that as an argument. The the plight of, of, of Palestinians also isn't universally just accepted at face value for what it is. Do you understand? Yeah. There's critiques that we could have about that. Not saying that we, we, we diminish the struggle, but there's critiques about every movement. And I think the, the assumption here that is being given uh, constantly gets thrown is like, oh, but if this was a Palestinian thing, it would have just been all love and praise. And, and, mm. and do, you, do you understand what I'm trying yeah, to say? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I didn't like that. That's one thing I didn't like. Let's, okay, let's not, let's not start replacing things just to send a message across because that itself waters down the the the, the, the palestinian struggle so to speak um mm. you know and, and my one of my one of my not not criticism actually a little bit of a criticism that i could say about mm. uh, maybe that is being brought up about the palestinian struggle is how the direction went towards nationalism as opposed to, and that's an issue with all muslim countries with yeah. any sort of struggle it's very nationalist focused as opposed to Mm, the grassroots focus. Is, yeah all my focus or the grassroots yeah. islam thing you know yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah i didn't i didn't like that personally mm. because i yeah. just thought but anyway carry yeah. on <laughs> no but but that's where that's what i was saying muhammad that uh, we were applying the things that we say in many episodes just to a new context right yeah, so yeah, for yeah. example if we were talking about um i talked about the algerian protest that happened uh, like a year ago in algeria um again for me my automatic reaction with protests is that uh, I don't know if that's going to work, right? I don't know. That, that's one thing that we generally, we're not too fond of protests, right? We've said that before, right? We don't, we don't really, not really convinced of how effective they are, right? Now, the other thing that we said is we don't really like the idea of going to an oppressive um, power and asking them to stop oppressing you, right? We believe more in becoming strong enough yourself that they are kind of forced to stop oppressing you, right? These are some principles that uh, if you listen to the, episode, the podcast, you would know we apply to, to ourselves. Like we apply these, uh, this to, our, uh, to Muslims, for example, or Algerians trying to get out of injustice or um, Palestine or the Arab Spring. We always kind of repeat these same things. So we're just taking what we say 
there and we're applying it here, right? So, inshallah. And you got something else too. And you might not have noticed it, but the two examples we just used here, the say Palestinian lives matter or Algerian lives matter, mm -hmm. we're talking about nations. Where yeah. black lives matter, we have a disconnected people. Mm -hmm. We didn't say Nigerian lives matters or, you know, Gambian lives matters or anything yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's different. And when you look at the history of the Atlantic slave trade, mm -hmm. you know, you've taken people and you've stripped them of their name, culture, and everything, and you put them all together. Yes. And it's, it's a little bit different than saying Palestinians, because you got black Palestinians, white Palestinians, brown Palestinians, yeah. the same thing for Algeria and everything. But black people seem to get lumped into one group. Yes. And uh, guess in case you guys didn't know, mm -hmm. uh, if you come to the, you know, to the U.S., and there's something, you know, happening and you're in the area, uh, both of you guys are getting arrested because uh, you're not white. <laughs> you're getting mistaken as, you know, Puerto Rican and they're cuffing you because Puerto Ricans are black. So you're going away too. And Muhammad, uh, you got a slight possible Mexican look to you. So you're getting locked up too. Well, maybe the Via does. Uh... <laughs> yeah. That was my... That you was might my... be Cuban, man. You might be with Castro with a beard, you know? That was my main focus, is that there may be a, a difference between active racism and stereotyping, all right? I think stereotyping is way more prevalent and the impacts, I think, are greater because it exists with the majority of people. I don't think anybody is free from stereotyping. Do you understand what I mean? So there are... And this is my thing about police brutality is that are police officers actively acting upon racism within them you know so they make a conscious decision i do not like this individual because of their skin color mm -hmm. or is it a stereotype that may not be so active in the mind however they you know they act upon it because it's it's almost like a subconscious thing um, unless it gets challenged directly mm -hmm. there and there mm -hmm. and but either of those two uh, is like a big problem, right? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. Of course. Whether it's uh, whether the person, like I think you mentioned, um, the the man that ended up uh, killing uh, George Floyd, uh, you said that he he seemed to be a racist person, like actively racist, consciously mm. racist. Um, mm. I think just as bad, or maybe worse, is the is the subconscious racism, right? And that's what uh, this sister is saying that we might have within us. But um, you know, for example, I think. Uh, there has been some research on uh, bias that judges have towards black people, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a really big problem because uh, how do you remove that? You know, it, it's harder to remove than the more conscious uh, racism. Um, mm. but, but Sharif, are you saying that, okay, if I'm Mexican, if I'm Puerto Rican, I'm going to face equal discrimination to black people? I mean, uh, or is... Surely what I heard is it's, it, it is worse for black people, even though there's racism elsewhere you know, to other people. Well, it's going to depend on the community that you're yeah. in. Mm. So if you're living, say, in uh, San Diego or Los Angeles, where we have a high you know, Mexican population, yeah. then you're going to have some serious problems. Mm. And if you're living in, say, Chicago or Philadelphia or New York and you're black, mm. then you're going to have some serious problems. Mm. Um, but the the difference is if you are not black if you're not you know african american your experience is going to be a lot different mm -hmm. you know yes um you could blend in as white and you know you're not as noticed yeah but when i'm out and about it's it's obvious yes. i'm not white yes you know yeah, yeah, yeah. although i have some white relatives some white ancestry I'm not white. I'm black, plain and simple. Yeah, yeah. So the experience will be different, and um, I'd be more likely to get pulled over. I mean, I have been uh, pulled over. This is a crazy one. I've been pulled over on my own property. Okay. Twice. Mm -hmm. Where you live now? Yes, where I live now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, the, the one time that I was stopped on my own property was by the game warden. 
Okay. So the game warden it carries a badge, carries a gun and, you know, can make, you know, stops and arrests and things like this. Mm-hmm. I was out driving the perimeter of my uh, fence line and it was nighttime and they drove by and whoop, whoop, lights mm-hmm. come on. Yeah. And they're like, what are you, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, checking my fence line for breaks. Mm-hmm. What do you mean you're checking your fence line? Cause this is my property mm-hmm. and I don't want my animals to leave. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, we thought maybe well, we heard about some poachers. Mm. So why? I'm sure, I mean, any other person in this county, mm. because, oh, let me go back a second. I am the first person that's black to be in this county. Mm. I'm the first person ever in the history of the U.S. Census, okay, my family, to be mm. black and to be Muslim in this county. Oh. So I don't fit in here. Mm. I have a lot of people are nice, but this guy's a game board and he wasn't from here. So he doesn't know me, mm. but uh, yeah, even if he doesn't know me, why could he assume that I own the property? Yeah. The second time that I was pulled over on my own property is uh, I was coming home and at the far end of my property, I saw some really bright lights. So I'm like, what's going on? So I got, I'm in my truck. I decided to turn around, go down there and see what's happening. Mm. Uh, I get down there. I see the police have somebody pulled over. And I thought somebody was out with a, a spotter messing with my cows because I have dairy cows. People have other cows, meat cows. So they look different. Mm. So I thought somebody was messing with my animals. Uh, I went down a little bit further to the next road. I turned around. And when I drove by, I looked to the right where the cop was. He looked me in the eye. I looked him in the eye. Mm. Okay. And I continued on driving. So from where that cop was back to my property, um, was almost two miles. Mm. Okay. 15 minutes later, Mm. he comes onto my property. I'm home. Mm. He comes onto my property, lights, and all this stuff. So I'm like, I don't know what's going on. I get out of my truck to go back. He's like, get back in the truck. Mm. He starts hollering and screaming and just, you know, acting a fool. Mm. So he comes up with his light, shines it all in my eyes. Mm. Uh, I lost it for a second. You know, I I said some profanity at him, telling him to get the light out of my eyes. Mm. Uh, Then he wants my license and registration. And I'm like, you want my license for what? I said, I'm home. Yeah, well, if you don't have your license and registration, you know, that's another crime. Crime of what? Another. Being- it's not if you're on your own property, surely. So, and I got no trespassing signs. Hmm. Uh, and he, he drove 600 feet onto my property. Yeah. Okay. Um, to where my office is, where I'm speaking to you uh, from now. Yeah. Um, so he checks out my stuff. He has my license, registration. He goes back to his car. He's looking, obviously sees that the address that's listed out there is my home address. I'm on my own property. Yeah. Uh, so I tell him I wanted to see the judge. And then he tells me, if you want to see the judge, uh, you're going to jail. I have to arrest you. Mm. So I'm like, what's, what did I do? What's the crime? Mm. And he said that um, one of my headlights was out. Mm. So That's just fishing the stuff, man. So I'm like, okay, well, I wasn't aware of that. He says, well, hmm, you are now. So I said, okay. So he wrote up his paperwork and everything. Um, and then he left. And I said, you know, I'm going to go see the judge. Well, afterwards, I checked. He wrote the paperwork up wrongly. He wrote up the wrong headlight. Mm-hmm. Okay. And <clears throat> one of my taillights was uh, out because when I uh, was backing up with my trailer, I pinched it. Mm. earlier in the day Mm. so then i started you know thinking why if he pulls up behind me didn't he write me up for my tail light Mm. and then he's going to write me up for another light that's in the front Mm. and all these things well i went to the judge and when i got to to the courthouse everything was dismissed Mm. but can he even write anything up for you if you're on your own property like the law here dictates that you can drive whatever you want in whatever condition it is on your own land you know, it yes, doesn't the same, legal. same thing here. So all of that is nonsense. <clears throat> but he wrote the paperwork up 
as if he stopped me two miles away from my house. Right, okay. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And again, I'm black. He sees me looking at him. And then he comes 15 minutes later on my property. Mm. So that's, so. that's like, a, what would you say that is? That's like a, a, a racist attitude that it's as though just because you looked him in the eye, that's uh, aggression or it, it's, it's, intimidation. It's the or yeah, it's, it's the revenge aspect of it. All, right? I don't know what it's, it is. I mean, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm in this county, so. There's a clear cut racism there. There's a clear cut racism there. But additionally, it's the, the revenge thing. So it's like, okay, you've looked at me in the eye and you've driven off. And then you've, you've obviously got a bit upset with him or whatever. But same yeah. thing, he's already shouted at you because you've done something of your own accord. And it's this control aspect, this control mentality of, I didn't tell you to get out of the car. Do you know what I mean? And now you're getting out of the car. Okay, so you're already being a bit more. I'm not saying that you've done anything wrong. This is his, this is his understanding. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I do, I mean, obviously not like over there, but I do see that day to day. I see people that make situations way worse than they need to be. You know, that we, you know, it's, it's, this, uh, it's this ego aspect, you know. You've got blue lights. You've got the, the the power to to do things to people, to 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 command people to do things, to put fear in people's hearts, to put people on the back foot, and it's the ego that gets away from you, you know. And I've said, I, I the only thing I listened to again was episode seventy-seven, where I said that the capacity for evil in this job is immense. You know, you are legally and I'm, and I'm you know putting my fingers up there legally pointing guns at people legally telling people what to do legally requesting people's you know personal information etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm. and you have if you're doing it for to, to to boost your own ego then you you will you, you know you'll run wild with that power there's just there's no there's no two ways about it what i what i wanted to touch upon sheriff is this just the, the one previous where it was the game warden, I believe it was. So they've yes. got power to pull you over, power for arrest. Um, I'm assuming they carry as well. Yes, they do. I just find that incredibly, like, I find that insane. So there must be so many different departments, <clears throat> so many different sort of uh, law enforcement sort of, I don't know, agencies. Yeah, departments, agencies, etc., mm -hmm. that all have this sort of shared power to some extent to carry, to arrest, to detain, etc., to request personal information from you. I find it incredible because clearly then there's no, there's no straight line in terms of expectation of what you're dealing with or what their training is or what the understanding is, or what the expectation is, you know, what the standards are. I think it's just a wild west, man. It's an absolute wild west out there. Well, I live in the Southwest, so it is kind of wild. And, uh, <laughs> but but yeah, it's, it's the way. <laughs> I don't even know for sure. Um, the requirements for like the game warden, I like, they usually have a degree in agriculture because they're dealing with, you know, livestock. But they also uh, have a badge and they're able to carry because uh, somebody might be cattle rustling. I mean, that still happens uh, yeah. here. So they might have to, you know, defend themselves against somebody who's stealing 100 cattle but, off somebody's farm. But that's, that's the issue. So what it should be, in my opinion, is it should be one police force with departments within that police force that deal with that sort of stuff. So we've got... Police office, like we've got, for example, a whole county's police force, which is one organization that covers the whole county. But within that police force, with the same training, the same expectations, same standards, you've got those who specialize in rural crime, for example, or agriculture, or do you know what I mean, or, or livestock, etc. However, if you took them, pluck them and put them in the city, they would also they would work the same exact with the same exact rules and regulations and standards and none. but like for example this game warden if you took him out of the, the area he's in and put him in the city he would know what he's doing you know which shows that there's a discrepancy there in stands and expectations how they treat people because at the end of the day no matter what uh, specialization you're in you're still de dealing with human beings you know mm -hmm. it doesn't matter where you where, what type of uh, specialization you're in whether it's rural whether it's you know uh, i don't know naval whether it's uh, even flipping uh, you've got police that use helicopters, for example, do you know what I mean? Like if you put them on the ground, they should be able to have the same set standards mm. uh, that conduct. you can judge. Mm. Yeah. Conduct that you can judge them by mm -hmm. that you can actually say, okay, this is the rule book. This mm -hmm. is me applying it to yourself. When yeah. you've, when you've, when you've multiplied that 
by so many different departments and agencies that can you do that. It's like, for example, I mean, it's like us saying, do you know what? Let's give traffic wardens the power to arrest. They're a completely different organization. Yeah, they aren't yeah. law enforcement. Yeah. You know? yeah different um, training completely. Yeah. Different training, different everything. So mm. it's, I just find that fascinating. And it's just a well, recipe for disaster. The, the history of the United States. Okay. Mm. So uh, if you go back to the founding, we have the difference between having a strong federal government or a strong state government. Mm. And then you have the local, you know, government, you got counties, you got within the county, you have, you know, towns, villages, cities, or whatever. And everybody doesn't want to answer to the other person. Mm. So for example, um, I live in New Mexico. So we have the New Mexico State Police Department. Yeah. So they're in charge of the state. Now, each department has a certain region, and I'm, I'm in the Northeast region, okay? Um, and then we have the county police, okay? So they're in charge of the county. So they're only uh, legally able to do anything in the county, but the state police can do the whole state, even outside of the area and the county. Yeah. And then at one time, we had a marshal. So the marshal was only uh, in charge of the village, which can be another conflict because right. you have the marshal who's in charge of the village and then the county police are in charge of the county and the village is within the county. Yes. Yeah. And their training doesn't have to be the same and their rules um, aren't necessarily the same either. Mm. That is, that, this is it. So once you've got um, any one of those different sort of groups, if, if the racism exists within an individual then it's so concentrated so the experience is then dished out very heavily however if it's one whole organization which from the top it's going to be clearly well they, they're going to want to be anti-racist anyway so they can function within society and that even if it's a pr thing that's what they want to do that's what they want to establish the norm for them in public and the message they want to send across is hey we're not racist we you know we serve mm. the people you know yeah. so if that is a, a monolithic organization whatever you want to call it then the racism that would exist on the bottom levels on the experience levels is going to be ideally watered down ideally mm. if because it does exist it's more centralized it's more centralized when something is decentralized uh, pe the, the, the smaller departments have more freedom to be racist, basically, that's what you're saying. Of course, yeah. It's yeah. like, you know, it's like constant, concentrated, proper proper concentrated. And I yeah. think that's, you know, that's what you become the victim of. You you then have cliques of people. You have any sort of group mentality. And I spoke about this before. Um, the culture of policing is, a, it's, it's almost like a sports team because the camaraderie is required. You know, you, it's a, a us versus them. I, even I, yesterday, well, I say yesterday, even this, so I worked this morning. I finished at seven in the morning. Um, and I, I raised issues with the camaraderie element was getting too much to the point where people were suffering the bully. There was bullying going on. And I just, I, I had to speak out against it because I just thought this isn't right. Like, mm. why should I put up with bullying within each other when I had to rely on you mm. for assistance? You know, you, every time I get, every time I walk into the kitchen, you're talking about this one individual all the time. What are you saying about me behind my back? Yeah. And how can I then, you know, I have to deal with uh, horrendous people outside. How does my mental health carry on well if I come in and I'm dealing with horrendous uh, speech and horrendous, you know, behavior in, in, in here as well? Mm. Um, the group mentality exists. There is, it's not like there's some sort of e e egalitarian sort of, oh, we're police officers and we're... No, we're mm. the same group dynamics, the same behaviors that we see within any sort of organization or any sort of, uh, you know, group dynamics, whatever exists within mm. uh, police departments as well. Yeah. Okay. Let's move on to some of these points now, inshallah. So, uh, so the sister said, uh, all the following is in, is in response to the points raised in the podcast, mostly by Amin. Here are the points. Okay. Oh, I mean, oh bro. Oh, right, bro. <laughs> no, I mean, honestly, uh, like I said, at the end of that podcast, I'm happy to be proven wrong. So let's see, maybe I, maybe I'll get schooled here. So, 
uh, not saying all right-wing people are racist or that anyone should be judged on their politics, but Amin, who himself said he has no experience of racism and therefore has the privilege to flirt with alternative views that debate whether Black Lives Matter. Amin started off the topic by amplifying a right-wing opinion with clear racist undertones that, don't, uh, that doesn't agree that Black Lives Matter is necessary. And then she said, imagine starting a Palestinian Lives Matter podcast by mentioning the dismissive views of an ultra right wing Israeli that you are subscribed to. So I didn't, I don't remember actually, um, what I said was that everyone uh, seems to be uh, agreeing with, uh, yeah, the whole uh, mainstream uh, approach to, to solving this problem, uh, except the only thing I've seen except is one right wing channel that I subscribe to. Now, Honestly, like you said, uh, right wing doesn't equal racist, right? Um, so she said, I'm, I'm, I started off the topic by amplifying a right wing opinion with clear racist undertones. I mean, I think there's not enough uh, specificity here for me to even uh, reply to this. But again, I'm not right. I'm not left. Um, I just was saying that that was the only place I saw uh, a differing view. I mean... I don't think there's even much to say about this, right? Um, I was just saying there's, the, there's, everyone is on one road and then I just saw another person on this side road, you know? And that's what we need to really make clear here is that we're all on the same direction, right? We're against racism. Um, but, you know, what we hope to highlight in our podcast in general is that the mainstream view is not the only correct view or is not always the correct view. And you should be aware of other views. That's pretty much it. That's all it is. Um, and they're not wrong just because they're right wing, but they're not right as well, just because they're different to the, the mainstream. Okay, next she says, completely denying the huge numbers of uh, black people's lives who have been so disproportionately deeply affected by police brutality, instead of instead adding personal experience, which do not involve black people, and then using that to argue whether that person on the floor is always the victim, and arguing that we should question whether the oppression against black people is a racist thing, or is it just bad policing? As someone who highly respects law enforcement, including the good police officers who do their difficult jobs correctly, I feel like your points were valid. Uh, Brother Muhammad would, would love to hear more about your experiences in another episode. It's just in this discussion, it was unintentionally misdirecting the conversation from the wider context of the police's oppression to black people. So I think um, I, I understand uh, what she's saying here. And I, uh, I, can, I can understand it like in terms of basically what she would like to hear more of is that, you know, clarifying that you know, there is racism in the police, for example. You know, maybe we needed to just be more clear about that. This is it. So um, when we, my, my critique of this critique is that you are only, the disproportionately thing, if that's based mm -hmm. on statistics, yeah. then, you know, that's, that's fine. Yes. Um, however, when a lot of people speak about disproportionately, they speak about what they see and what they see is what goes viral. You know? mm -hmm. And what sure, tends yeah. to go viral it tends yeah. to go viral is that which is framed in a, the racist mm. sort of this is a racist sort of police brutality incident yeah. it, it is disproportional for sure yes without a doubt. and then when you well, in, in america it is i, I don't know about any other places but in america of it's course. definitely disproportional of course um and then when you've when you've got that exposure this is why i wanted to focus on the the behaviors of of, of, of police in general is it uh the power trip thing, or is it the active I am racist, or is it the stereotype angle of it? And this is what we're trying to break down. Mm, yes. And, and the, the first point as well is that we know what the mainstream is. We know what the mainstream, the mainstream is. Yes, black lives do matter. Yes, p uh, police, uh, police departments are disproportionately racist or, or aggressive or brutal towards black people or people of color in general. Um, we know what that mainstream is, but if we just did an episode talking about something that a hundred other people have spoken about, then mm. there's no point, you know, we're yeah. going, to, going to benefit anybody that way. Mm. Yeah. I'd say it's more of a, a power trip mm. than being racist. Okay. Cause you can go into a police station and you know, you want to get help. It doesn't matter if you're black, white, red, yellow, then they're there. They're going to be polite and friendly with you. But when something is happening and they suspect something illegal, I mean, their voice is different. You know, they have to have authority. 
you know? So they're going to yell at you, black, white, red, yellow, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And then they get on this power trip, like I'm in charge, you know, you will comply with what I say. Mm -hmm. And there is a, a fear, you know, uh, against black people. Mm -hmm. uh, in general, we're going to have to use a stereotype here. If the police say something to a white person, they're just going to be like, okay, officer. Mm. Uh, but if you start yelling at a black person, like what I do, why? Yeah. Because, you know, yeah. too many black people have been taken into custody and they've been hurt, killed or something. So now they're like, you know, nah, you ain't putting cuffs on me. Why? So then the cop wants to assert his authority over. Mm -hmm. uh, then it can escalate people. more. Yes. Yeah. Even more and more. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not but that's saying a good that. thing, I would say, Sharif, that um, and I think that this is something that is uh, that is actually uh, it's uh, present amongst uh, black people in the US and in Africa as well. Right. That I guess it's part of a culture which has been passed on, even though African-Americans are disconnected from from the continent of Africa, is that uh, they have they have dignity and pride right and certain cultures actually have less of that right now if i mention who those is i might get a whole other slew of comments but um there are definitely uh, amongst different people different cultures different there is an element of uh, some people have more dignity and pride and some people are you could call them more humble more um kind of uh, passive you could say um, and I, I think that's a good thing, to be honest. Uh, it might cause problems in terms of, yeah, now you trigger the policeman to be uh, aggressive and, and assert his power. But, uh, you know, I, I think overall it's a good thing, especially as a Muslim, where you've got to be prepared to stand up for what's right. And that's what is happening here, isn't it? It's like, you want to cause problems for me. I've done nothing. Now I'm going to defend myself. I'm not going to just lay, lay down and turn the other cheek kind of thing. I think the trap right. that I fall into, which is maybe why... I sometimes take this to an angle that people don't agree with is because my worldview, what I see day to day is because I, I work in a predominantly white uh, area mm. and everyone we deal with 99% of them are white. Right? So the same, uh, I don't know if you call it not brutality, but this is the same power trip that I, that, um, often people complain about in terms of uh, whether it's the black experience in America or in London, for example, you know, in, in, in areas where there's a predominantly black population. I see that day to day here where there's the, the police officers, white, the suspects are white, or, you know, the, even the victim was white, whatever. And I see all those assumptions and I see all those egos and power trips there, which is why mm -hmm. sometimes my worldview is this is a police ego problem. This is a police uh, mm -hmm. sort of power trip problem. Yes. As opposed to, and that's, that's my fault, I think, because I'm yeah. not, I'm not seeing, you know, that compared to the black experience. I see it. Oh, I see it's daily. Police police, being, it's police and police. That's what, mm. that's my issue. Yeah, and that's yeah. why I always lean towards the, oh, the root of the problem here is the power trip ego element of it. Mm. Um, but that's because yeah. of what I see. Mm. That's because of what I see. Yeah. It's probably, it, this is the thing. It's a very complicated um issue right so there will be a power trip element and uh, there will be a racist element right and we can't say both of those are always present but when they're both present it's hard to determine what percentage of the uh, injustice is happening because of the power trip and how much is it happening because of racism it's difficult isn't it it's just you can't measure those things right but we're definitely we're not denying um, both of those elements exist what do you think sharif like you said it's more power trip but um you know, why are you saying that versus it's more racism or whatever? Well, I mean, it's uh, often noticed that people who go into the police force are either their father or, you know, mother or somebody, a relative was a police officer. It's a family tradition. Right. Um, and then we have often people who were bullied. Mm. They want to be police officers because now they want respect. Mm -hmm. And then when you're in this organization, you know, it's that fraternity. You guys are brothers. You will protect yeah. each other, like no matter what. You got to make sure everybody goes home. So that bully who, uh, you know, never had authority and was always picked on, mm. he knows if he hollers at somebody or he puts somebody down on the ground, and his partner who's been, like, uh, this is the third generation, you know, police officer, he's going to have his back no matter mm. what. 
Mm. Mm-hmm. There's also the, the, the biggest, I read a, uh, an article from an ex-police officer, I think she was black, and I couldn't agree more with everything she said regarding this culture. And it's exactly like school. So if I was to come in and speak about my passion for serving the community, for protecting people, for, uh, you know, apprehending offenders who are raped, robbed or whatever, you know, all of the above sort of thing. And I was, that was my, like, this is why I've joined. Like, and I speak about that openly and I'm passionate about that daily. You would actually get made fun of because it's like, that's, you know, just shut up that's not cool kind of thing just like school you know it's like someone going into school and saying oh i want to i want to really educate myself and 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 benefit my community etc etc people would make fun of them the cool kids would make fun of them right and there is this there is definitely this sort of i don't want to call it toxic masculinity because that's very but do you understand what i'm trying to say like this sort of like uh like this bro atmosphere kind of lad well here we've got like the lad culture sort of thing which is very prevalent that's not cool you go to like uh, put it this way you go to people that die right and and jokes are being made just so they can deal with it and if you start talking deeply about the death of the individual then people are like well that's too much like there's no substance to it so everything is a bit of a like a cool culture cool, cool kids club sort of thing and if you're not cool you made fun of, mm. you know? Mm. Mm. Um, so I think that the point being made here was that I was questioning uh, if all of the issues with uh, the injustices by police are because of racism, basically. Is it disproportionately to, to black people? Um, and you said that's, that is true, uh, Sharif, right? I think- yeah, It's I, disproportionate to black people, yeah. without a doubt. I mean, the people yeah. that get arrested, the incarceration rate is just, incredible when yes. we have somebody for example uh commit two people commit the same exact crime yeah mm. um i'll give you a case i can't remember the exact details mm. but there was uh, a college student who raped a girl and he was given probation yeah and then uh because he was about to go to one of the top colleges uh or transfer or something and they said that this would uh, have a negative effect basically on his life. Okay. So he was given probation. Right. And he raped a woman. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't understand. He was white. Yeah. 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 Mm. Now, also, I, sorry, a black Glenn, person did the same you. thing and, you know, he was going away. He got locked up. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So I think uh, because I've, I've seen some, uh, and this was, you know, a while ago, so I don't, I didn't memorize it, but because I saw some numbers that indicated maybe it's not disproportionate, etc. I said, I mentioned that in, a, in passing. Um, and, you know, maybe I, maybe that's wrong, right? But I just said, I'd heard of that. So if I'm wrong, then I'm wrong on that. Uh, maybe I shouldn't have mentioned it before I double checked it. So Sherif, Sherif, uh, what does, hold my hands up on that. Sherif, when that happens, mm-hmm. and then that, that specific case, are you aware of any sort of anything beyond the sharing of the fact on social media to challenge that sort of that thing happening. For example, uh, I don't know, not just petitions, but putting pressure on the system to answer that question, you know? Yeah. They put Is, pressure on the judges because the judges, um, I don't know how they are uh, in the UK, but they're elected officials here. Okay. So if they are, it's kind of crazy. If they're too hard on crime in an area that doesn't want tough laws and regulations, they'll be voted out. Okay. And if they're too easy on crime, mm. then the people who want, you know, tougher laws and regulations, they'll be voted out. Right. Um, so they called for that judge's, uh, the example I gave, they called for his resignation. Okay. You know, to be like removed. Mm. Right. Mm. I, I don't know if he was removed though, but okay. they called for it. Okay. I heard of a story where, uh, I think he's a university student in the US. He went to uh, Mexico on holiday. And while he was there, he became aware that like basically he could be a mule. Okay. He could carry drugs across the border, make some money, pay for his tuition fees or whatever. Yeah. So uh, he, he did it. And um, the thing is on the plane, on the way to the US, the, he had the, these drugs stored in his stomach. Okay. And mm-hmm. one of them popped. Okay. Um, while he was on the plane. And because he was a medical student, he, he, he actually seemed quite uh, from a wealthy family. 
because uh, he's a medical student, he knew that if he, you know, just carried on like this, he's probably going to die, right? It was cocaine that he had in his stomach. So uh, he, he, he actually got through the airport um, security and everything. Um, he was in Florida, I think, and uh, he knew he had to go to a hospital. So he ended up in a hospital and he just, he just said, like, I've got cocaine in my stomach. They pumped his stomach. They saved his life. And I think he did something like six months in jail, right? And he's carrying a lot of cocaine. Um, and everyone in the comments is just like, if this guy wasn't white, like he'd be uh, in jail for a lot longer. So I thought that was a crazy, but the, the, the crazier thing was the way he was, cause they got him to, to tell the story himself. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. It was like, he didn't really have any regret. Um, it's like no regret for like breaking the law, no regret for like not doing his time and no regret for like, really in the end, you're supplying like poison to people. Um, no regret, you know? And, and I think he went back to, to uni, he's finishing his uni. Um, he just got like all that debt and stuff, but crazy, man. He's probably a first time offender. Yeah. Okay. He's white, mm. college student, mm. uh, family with money, mm. and it's cocaine. Mm. It's a, you know, call it a white people's drug. If it was yeah, crack. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, I was going to yeah. say. If it was crack, even the, if the amount was less. Uh. Uh, you know, and the person's black, yeah. they're going to jail. And, and this is what I was saying uh, on the episode, last episode, is that uh, I think this is where the focus needs to be, like in these injustices, um, in that sense, like why is, is cocaine less bad than, than crack, for example, right? This is where uh, we were talking about like the, the, the deeper racism, right? Deeper than calling someone some, a name in the street or whatever. I was saying basically that if I if we have to focus on one over the other, let's focus on the uh, you know prison industrial complex. Let's focus on these uh, laws that target specific drugs over other drugs because black people tend to sell those other type of drugs, right? That's what I was uh, trying to say basically. And ultimately, a lot of that can't be broken down unless you, I mean, tearing down a system. I don't know how you could feasibly do that. Mm. I don't know how you can. Mm. Because there's people that call for, I mean, there are, there's extreme ends of every spectrum. There's people that call for the absolute teardown of the system mm. and replace it with a new one overnight. Well, yeah, I don't, that's not feasible. Mm. But then there's also people within those systems that struggle to, to implement change, that to actually, mm. they genuinely believe that they are there to do something to, uh, to change the way things are. Mm. And I think, to me at least, I don't know about you brothers, but to me at least, I think, okay, that's probably the most effective way of doing this because at least you're not losing out on experience. It's like erasing a state and then telling everybody to, I mean, you see, okay, let's talk about briefly like Syria, for example, when Syria got the, the civil war happened in Syria, whatever you want to call it in Syria. Mm, and there was, happening. there was, po yeah, there's populations of people mm. that now needed, needed law enforcement or they needed judges or they needed this. And it was just like, let's just grab anybody who is relatively educated in any field and put them in that position because we've got nobody else, you know? Mm. So you had, you had people uh, enforcing law that may have just been, I don't know, any sort of, any sort of, thing to fill the gap you know so you yeah. need you don't want to lose out on that experience of okay this is how this works this is how that works this is what experience we can bring to the table mm. so you're mm. going to need people engaged within the system who a lot of people think oh you're part of the system you're the enemy do you yeah. understand well actually yeah. you don't know that person may be mm. actively trying to change mm. things from mm. within i think uh, that is an area where i can see people like legitimately disagreeing with you on but just mm. because you were saying change the system from within like there's always a, a debate isn't it uh, tear it down start fresh or change from within right that's a constant uh, argument a uh, debate um but just because you were suggesting to change it from within it just certainly doesn't make you racist just for thinking that like that's just genuinely what you think uh would be better to to actually mm. uh deal with this problem um and it so, uh, I, for example yeah in Algeria, you know, the protests that were ha happening last year and stuff, uh, they were saying, you know, the, the slogan they had was, yeah, they, they got to all go, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And um, that's something that I actually can agree with when we talk about these top um, uh, levels of uh, politicians, not just politicians, but corrupt business people who are involved with yeah, the politics, yeah. is that uh, basically all the, not all, but the bad is really trickling down from them. And they're, 
basically it's kind of a, a, a level where there's no good in them, right? There's mm. only bad that they're bringing. So I can understand that. Uh, but then, you know, the police, you could say, could be under their direction. But the average policeman, we're not going to say get rid of them. We're not going to say get rid of even what, one of the worst uh, parts of the government in, the, in Algeria is the security services, right? Or the intelligence. Even them, I'm sure at the lower levels, especially, there are people we want to keep there, right? Like, so mm. it's nuanced, man. It's like so complicated. Sharif, have you had much experience or any engagement with black police officers? I mean, you said one of them was your neighbor, for example. Oh, yes, yes. I, I mean, I grew up with him. Is there I any mean, perspective that he shared regarding police brutality or his view on that sort of narrative? You know, not at all. No, I mean, and uh, before, um, I don't know if I told you guys, but uh, I've been doing judo since uh, 1980, you know, yeah. 84. Uh, and I used to train with police officers, state police officers in Pennsylvania. Right. Right. And uh, my one good friend, Jim, he's black. Yeah. Uh, nicest guy you'd ever want to meet. Uh, and then there's a guy, you know, uh, Pat White. So he's a state trooper too. Nicest guy you want to meet. And um, it wasn't a thing of, I guess, racism. I mean, there's just a, a brotherhood that they share. Mm. I've never, I'm going to think about it. Uh, mm -mm. Not myself personally. I can't think of any negative experience I had with a black police officer. Mm. It's, it's a perspective I, I'd love to see amplified because um, that's where, that's where I want to, that's where you find out really if it's a, an integration into police culture or an active sort of, do you understand what I'm trying to say, or somebody trying to change things from within? Because I've been well, in a, I've situations where I've, I remember recently there was a, a black individual that we that was being dealt with in the police station, and uh, he got into an argument with lots of police officers, and he was facing all the white police officers, saying, "You're racist, you're racist, you're racist," and then he turned to me and goes, "Brother, you know what I'm talking about. You know, in <laughs> like he goes, you know deep inside how you feel about all of this," hmm. and I felt obviously I'm not. I'm not black. However, I know what he's trying to get at. And I was just like, this is fascinating. He saw me and assumed, he assumed that I am, uh, that this is a racist incident. Well, it wasn't. I, I honestly don't think this was anything to do with race. He just didn't have the paperwork that he required to get what he wanted. Um, but he assumed that I am a, like a, sil a suffering in silence within this organization. If you understand what I mean, and I found that very interesting that that was a dynamic that from the outside perspective, people thought that I was a, I don't know, like a, a token officer. You know? <laughs> well, I, I think it comes down to, uh, well, for me, for my experience is yeah. that where you live. So for example, uh, I live outside, why well, I did outside of Philadelphia. Yeah. In Philadelphia, there are a lot of black police officers, a lot of Muslim police officers. Yeah. And you actually, you go to the masjid and you'll be praying next to officers yeah, with their yeah. pist pistol on their side yeah. with, you know, big beards. Um, and they can better relate to the community because they're, they're from the community. They know the people. Um, so there's less of an issue. Mm. And where I actually grew up uh, for a good portion of my life was Coates Hill, Pennsylvania. And the population there is about like 40... 7% black and uh, man, four, it's almost 50-50 black and white. Mm. Mm. Uh, and then we have some Puerto Ricans, some Mexicans, you know, other <laughs> ethnicities. Um, but it's really, it's different there. Mm. Um, there's not really, from what I remember, and uh, no police brutality. Everybody's pretty much treated equally. Um, and even the history of this place, my grandmother went to school there and she graduated the class of 1949, I think. Mm. And she went to an integrated school. I mean, where other schools and other places were segregated. Mm -hmm. Um, so this particular area, my particular experience, uh, you know, might be different than other black people. Mine was 
it just really changed when I went to middle school because, mm. you know, as years go by, demographics change and people's understanding and, mm. you know, other things change. That's why, but, like, diversifying that workforce is so important. I, I value that so much. I mean, even here, like, the, the, the bad kids in this city are, mm-hmm. a lot of them are Muslim, right? So a lot of them are, you know, a lot of the drug dealers that are often come to notice that are not white, because most of them are white here, but the ones aren't white are predominantly Muslim, um, even if that you know they're black or Arab or whatever. Um, and I've had it where they'll see me, they'll engage with me because I saw I watch them, especially the younger ones. I watch them grow up into who they are today. You know, if, you know when you were seven or eight years old, you were praying in a masjid with your dad, and now you're a teenager and you're you know selling drugs. But you treat me like an adult you respect because you, I know your reality. I know where you came from. I know your parents. I know. And they'll see me in the street and I could be working and they'll come up to me and say hello, say salam, etc. And then my colleagues will be like, what the hell is going on? And I'll be like, listen, I know, I know that kid. I know what he's about. I know, what, you know, I know his family. I know where he's come from. Um, and they'll engage with me but in a different way that they won't engage with, um, mm-hmm. with others. And, and, and just like you pointed out in Philadelphia, like that diversifying of that workforce is so vital especially if it's from communities. You know, you've got mm. white officers that have nothing to do with Muslims or nothing to do with the Muslim community or the black community, or whatever, and they haven't grown up there. So immediately it's like, this is foreign to me. You know? And then mm. let me throw in all my stereotypes into this mix as well. Um, and that's how I'm going to judge the situation that I'm presented with right now. Yeah. Um, ultimately, the, those serving the public need to reflect the public. You know, they need to reflect the, com- the communities mm. that they serve. Um, and if you haven't got that, then all, you've just got this big room for stereotyping. Mm. And let me guess what that's about. You know, let me guess what they're about over there because I don't know. So let me judge that based on my own yeah. sort of stereotypes. Mm. Yeah, I think being, like you said, growing up in that city or that area, that makes a big difference, right? Mm-hmm. But on the flip side, Mohammed, if, if the police were going to represent the population of the area, wouldn't mm. nine out of 10 of them be white anyway? depends it depends what the area is i mean no, i'm uh, saying like your area for example yeah possibly possibly however i think it'd still be more i think there'd still be more and what happens is mm. it takes a certain type of person if you're going to be in that job you have to be someone who's going to this is where it comes to the hiring process right it has to be someone that's going to make a positive impact you can't just hire timid people or quiet this isn't a job for people who are quiet or people can't mm. speak or people can't but, engage but that's the so, problem bro even in corporate world People hire and they keep you there if you're quiet, in it. Of course, but okay. this is, but in this role, in this role specifically, you're, it's a people's job. You're dealing yeah, because with yeah, it's because it's a justice 90, issue for sure. Yeah. Ninety percent of this job, ninety-five percent of this job is talking to people. Yeah, you, know? you resolve yeah. issues just by talking to them. Yeah, and if you haven't got somebody who can talk, who can make an impact, then those skills aren't also in the actual organization itself internally. For example someone should be able to come to me internally and ask me questions about my religion, which is what happens. You know, there have been investigations where there's been Muslims that are, are the victims, suspects, or whatever. And they'll come to me because I'm there and I'll be like, listen, I just wanted your opinion on this or whatever. And I can give them that answer or I can help them with that job or deal with that in a respectful, appropriate way uh, to which they would have no idea. Mm-hmm. And then there's offense can be caused. And then there's this, well, I didn't know I was doing anything wrong. And then there's, oh, you've got prejudice or this. Well, mm-hmm. you ha- there has to be an understanding. You can't expect, and this is it, you can't expect, you can't force white police officers, the predominant, white male police officers, the predominant sort of um, population there to understand and inherit every culture and be... Mm. Especially quickly, yeah. Yeah, and they're not going to do that in their own lives. You know, their mm. personal lives are, I'm going to go home to my family, I'm going to go to the pub or the bar, I'm going to, do you understand? I'm going to live out my culture and I can't help but bring that in with me mm. into work. Do you understand? Yeah. Because that's my life. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's move on. Like, because once we get through these, then we can like freestyle yeah, sorry, and go into yeah. some. Because uh, <laughs> there's, there's, really, <laughs> there's important... Uh, interesting things we could discuss inshallah once we we're done with this so um so the next point was uh downplaying racism by focusing on individual experiences and saying it's more of a u.s thing firstly sharif you know you listen to it do you think we were actually downplaying racism like at all i don't think we're downplaying racism it's just that you're giving examples that are familiar to you okay 
so you might give an example so you're talking and saying about you know uh algerian protest yeah because you don't have the information on yeah uh american protests or being black or just yeah. experiencing you know the police here so yes. you're trying to find something that's similar and related to the situation yes yes and um uh, but yeah that's not downplaying playing it i guess uh, the way I try and see uh, these situations is there is the sunnah Allah. Okay, there are certain ways that Allah made the world work. Uh, basic example is that all empires rise and fall, right? They all mm -hmm. do that. Even Muslim ones will, right? So I just try and see situations and see the similarities and try and apply that understanding sunnah Allah. So uh, yeah, so I'm trying to draw the similarities. I, I'm really wasn't trying to downplay it. Um, okay. Uh, then, then they say, um, saying the Black Lives Matter movement is completely useless because those in power are, are inherently racist, like we don't know that already. And also, this is downplaying racism because, yes, it's true. Sadly, racism may be something we struggle with till Day of Judgment, but racism is not just the N-word. It's so much bigger than that. Uh, than that. So we need to look at the wider context and call out the systematic racism and white supremacy that keeps black people oppressed and that people are fighting to dismantle. I mean, this is exactly what I was saying. So, I mean, if you think um, I was against that, that's exactly what I was saying. Uh, like, it's exactly what I was saying. Um, racism is not just the N-word. It's so much bigger than that. It's like I said, uh, people, yeah, people who own prisons are conspiring for how we can tweak the laws and how we can have policing like this and that so we get more people in the prisons right mm -hmm. now i don't know why uh, because they get paid for that right they get paid for every inmate they have in their prison by the government right uh and this is the you know one of the first things need to change is private prisons but anyway um now why why do they go after black people to try and get black people in i don't know maybe they maybe the people who own the prisons are racist that's an option maybe they just see it as a, an easy target or well, i don't know what it is right but well, uh, it's the fact that mm. when you look at the whole united states mm. the black people have less wealth mm -hmm. than white people mm. so if you're going to go to trial mm. okay a white family is more likely to hire a lawyer to represent their child than a yes. black family. Black family is going to get a public defender. Yeah. Public defender has so many cases, they're just mm. there for show, really. Yeah, yeah. So these black kids are going to end up going to the prison where the white kids aren't. Mm. So yeah. there's Easy, your yeah. like your ticket. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, and that that's again part of the system that uh, uh, wealth isn't distributed equally between white people and black people, right? And Correct. You, you would have what we would hope is that even though there was slavery, you know, apparently it's over and everything, and that eventually it would take some time, but eventually it would come equal. But because of like this, what I was saying in the episode, because of other things put in place after slavery, um, it's not become equal, right? There is still a lag there because of it. Like what I was saying, like uh, you probably know this uh, be much better than me, Sharif, like uh, they call the eighties, the crack era, isn't it? Because of, mm. uh, and this was, intentional um intentionally infiltrating black neighborhoods with drugs right mm. um th this is a big uh, big element there's 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 that I, I don't know if you guys have watched it i've watched a netflix documentary called 13th regarding the 13th mm. amendment and mm. it was i think what the contention was that the, the filmmakers trying to put across is that how slavery was replaced by incarceration mm. through yeah a, a period a long period it wasn't you understand through this sort of uh, I mean, there's a short blurb here. It says, um, contends that the slavery has been perpetuated since the end of the American Civil War through criminalizing behavior and enabling police to arrest poor freed men and force them to work for the state mm. uh, under convict leasing, suppression of African Americans yeah. by disfranchising, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Um, and, it, and it, it does, I don't know if anyone wants to watch that. And people, I think the critics might have already seen that, definitely. Um, mm. Yeah. But, yeah. But, but that's because it goes back to what you were saying. What is their intention for predominantly? Uh, incarcerating uh, black people. Yeah, and no doubt there are, I mean, not no doubt, I, I can't say this for a fact, but uh, uh, anecdotally, we can say there are people who are still bitter because slavery has ended, right? Even though it's, it's so long ago, but uh, the, there were, uh, especially people in the South who relied on this, this was, they feel it's their right to be able to own people and they work on the land and 
et cetera. And then it was taken away from them. That's what they would mm. say. And um, they're, they're still bitter until today. Now, inshallah, those attitudes are really fading, but uh, I can see how it's still there for sure. Oh, yeah, definitely. When I was in the Marine Corps, mm. uh, there was a guy that was part of my platoon that was from Georgia, okay? And he was in the Klan. Mm. Oh, and at that time, yeah? Well, I don't know if he was still actively, yeah. but he was in the Klan. And he explained to me mm. that, you know, as a kid, it was like a, a club. Every, mm. all the white people in his area were in the Klan. Mm. Right. So, and you know, with that, they're gonna talk about the segregation of race, uh, races and white supremacy and all these things. Mm -hmm. Even if they don't necessarily agree with it, they're hearing it constantly. They're hearing it from their, their parents, their friends, their neighbors, mm -hmm. and this subconscious message is going to be there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, when he came into the Marine Corps, because the Marine Corps tries to break down all racism and they take everything away from you when you come in and they, they rebuild you. Mm. And they tell you everybody's green. There's no black people. There's no white people. Okay. We're all green. Mm. Some are light green. Mm. Some are dark green. Mm. <laughs> but uh, we're all green. Mm. And even the, your shelter, they give you half a shelter. It has to be snapped together with somebody else. Mm. Or you get wet in the jungle. So there's different things they do to break down racism. Mm. Uh, hopefully, uh, these things, you know, had a hold on him. But... He told me that when he was a kid, he was in the clan. It was just like a gang, mm. a club. It's, it's mm. mad that that even still exists. Like, and that's where, like, yeah, people have every right to be emotionally enraged. That you can you can outlaw ISIS within you know a few weeks of its inception, but you can't outlaw you know the Ku Klux Klan that's existed for God knows how long. See, it's but just, what they're doing at the same time, uh, I don't know if you've seen on social media. But a lot of people are saying that Black Lives Matters is a hate group, and they're no different than the Klan. Right. Uh, these are white people who are upset from the attention that they're getting, mm -hmm. and also people who are attaching themselves to the movement who are doing things other than what the movement says they're about. Because mm -hmm. the movement yeah. is clear. Let's say they want to make uh, changes, and they believe in civil disobedience Nonviolent, and I mean, it's it's very clear what they say they believe. Mm, but yeah. then you had people who were claiming to be part of Black Lives Matters, and they're burning down things, flipping police cars, attacking you know, mm. white people, anybody. Mm -hmm. So mm. that That's negative typical uh, uh, group tactics. is being linked to Black Lives Matter, mm. and then everybody. Well, not everybody. It's, uh, people are just saying they're a hate group. Yeah, it's funny, actually. You mentioned that. Um, we grabbed someone a couple of months ago um, vandalizing property at night. And uh, we chased them, got them, grabbed them in the car, you know, whatever, rest, whatever. And it was some white teenager who was absolutely clueless. Like, so he started, because it was a, he was spray painting, like, all well, this Black Lives Matter stuff and breaking things or whatever. <laughs> Uh, and I just, I couldn't help but sort of grill him a little bit on, okay, so what's your intention? What are you trying to, Achieve. what's your motive tonight? He just didn't, he couldn't answer any questions to me. Like he mm. just didn't understand yeah. anything. Mm. He just, he just, he, and I'm not trying to water this down at all, but it all honestly came across as like, everyone's doing it. I thought I'd get involved kind of thing because mm. he had no strong feelings towards anything. He couldn't answer basic questions on the, the movement or the plight or whatever it is. And listen, we're probably white area. This is just, you know, the, you know, even if you look at the black lives, pro, black lives matter protests that occurred in my city, look at the, the, the coverage of it. You, you'll be pressed to find any black people in that crowd because of just yeah. the demographics of this, this, this city that I'm in. So well, it's popular to be in the movement. It's popular. Mm -hmm. I mean, you got like, it's crazy. You got Nancy Pelosi, you know, from the democratic party, um, She's got Kente Cloth on and she's taking a knee and she's got all the other Democrats doing the same thing. Like Kente Cloth is like indicative of all black people. No. Mm. And since like black lives didn't matter before and now because everybody's doing it and mm. you want to make sure the Democratic Party stays in power and can get rid of Trump. Mm. You're going to align yourself with this. I don't think they really care. 
I mean, after the election and everything starts to fizzle out, uh, let's see what happens. 30, it was, I think about 31 years ago, we had the whole thing with Rodney King, okay? And we had protests, we had riots, we had fire, we had all kinds of stuff. And the movement was like this, and then it disappeared, like 30 years, it was just gone. Mm. Now we have another movement, and it's, it's, it's more like this, it's just shooting straight up. Mm -hmm. um, and what's gonna happen? Is it gonna fizzle out? Are people gonna actually go the distance and do what's necessary to bring about change, mm. you know? So um, what, what do you think that is? That's the key thing, isn't it? What, what is it do you think that's necessary to bring about change in America? Muhammad, should we, let's, let's discuss that after the criticism. I'm gonna write that down, because that's the key yes, thing that I want that, to that's, discuss. Yeah. That's what I want to actually spend a lot of time on, but yeah. obviously we want to deal with the criticism as well. Um, but uh, uh, what were we saying? Yeah, uh, so, so yeah, Sharif, like there's a lot of, like you were saying, Muhammad, uh, some people are just following and it's attractive to be in a, in a protest and in a group and we're all together and it feels good, but uh, the hard work uh, takes decades, I guess. Um, and this is, this is what I wanted to say that I didn't say on the last one, is that, um, I'm trying to remember it now, uh, it was something to do with uh, following. It'll come back to me, let's go to the next point. So uh, <laughs> talking about how disorganized the Black Lives Matter movement is, right? So this is apparently a bad, uh, a criticism so uh, so in so insensitive because bear in mind the pain and trauma this movement is born out of when lives are at stake sorry that organization skills are not at the forefront okay so um yeah this i think something that you said muhammad that you know there's well, no clear goal and there's no leaders and stuff yeah because then you've just got people what what is it you what what is it that you're actively trying to change you have to be specific about what your goal is so that you can direct all your energy into that and it's very difficult to do that when you haven't got leadership that is reminding everybody of what they're here for do you understand what i mean mm. uh i'm you know uh Shelley, if i remember we spoke when I, I don't know if it was a voice note that i heard you talk about this but your comments on on the lack of leadership or the lack of a defined goal were quite poignant i don't know if you want to interject here yeah, I mean, if we look back at, say, during the civil rights movement, where you had civil rights leaders, Malcolm X, you know, uh, Martin Luther King, uh, John Lewis, who just uh, died, you know, a congressman from the U.S., there was, there was leadership. And regardless of your social economic status, um, your religion, they were able to unify the people. They had, like, one goal. And this is not what's happening right now. You have so many splinters. Yes, these issues do need to be taken care of, but it's like a, a medical triage. You gotta, what's the most important thing right now? What has to be addressed? We work on that. Get that accomplished, go on to the next thing and the next thing, or maybe pick three things. But right now they're so scattered, in my opinion, and from what I've seen, that um, it's going to be hard to get anything accomplished. There needs to be a strong leader or leaders organizing things on a national uh, level mm. to bring about change. Yeah. yeah. I mean, saying, so if this, if this current, um, current incident sparked from the police brutality or, you know, and the killing of George Floyd, so there has to be a specific, initially at least, a specific sort of, let's 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 deal with this issue right here but you can't just say let's end police brutality we want to end police brutality police brutality isn't something in law like we you know that officers must be brutal it wasn't what i was trying to say before because some i think one of the critiques was like i argued that before was clear-cut racism and now it isn't clear-cut racism what mm -hmm. i intended to mean by that is that when i say clear-cut i'm talking about legislation was racist in the sense that there was you know there was segregation in law yeah. You know, there's, this is for colored, this is for whites. Like, that's what I'm talking about. And what, that was what was fought against. So you can actually say, okay, the legislation, what's on the pen, yeah. what's on pen and paper right now is what needs to be fought mm. against. Mm. But however, if you look at legislation and laws now, you'd be hard pressed to find anything that is, you know, mm. clear cut racism. Yeah. And that's what my intention was. Now, mm. now on, the, on paper, yeah. everybody's, we're all equal. Exactly. Okay. And I just want to point out, I don't, I don't know if you misunderstood or you're just pointing out a point now. 
but the Black Lives Matter movement in 2013, I believe it, with Trayvon, yeah, yeah. Uh, when he was killed. Yeah. Uh, so for seven years, the movement's been there, but only now is, you know, people are jumping on board because mm -hmm. of a, you know, a recent killing and they're saying that's it. Now, my concern is wh where were they before? And I understand, yes, there, there comes a point in your life where you're like, yeah, I can't take anymore. Yeah. And then, yeah. but ev everybody now at the same time, everybody mm -hmm. can't take anymore. I mean, it just seems like this whole follower mentality when somebody does something and there's a group, yeah, I want to be part of that group. Yeah. Um, and I'll probably get you guys in trouble for this, but I'm sorry. So uh, <laughs> the Me Too, Me Too movement. Okay. Yeah. Oh, we already dealt when, with that, Sharif, so you're welcome. <laughs> okay, so when one person spoke out, oh. then the next person spoke out, the next person, then you have all of these people coming and speaking. Yeah. Now, I'm not going to say that uh, trauma isn't real, and yes, yeah, some of these people, some of these women were just afraid, and then they got confidence to speak when other yeah. women came forward. Mm, definitely. But we've also, and it's been proven, and then they apologize, other women lied. It was just part of that, uh, I want to be in the moment and I want to be known uh, thing. Mm -hmm. And this could be happening, you know, with Black Lives Matter. The same exact thing. People just want to be part of it. Uh, Colin Kaepernick, you know, he was protesting, taking a knee. Yeah. Nobody, like, yeah. you know, really yeah. cared. That's something yeah, that I, I was thinking of, that... I was I was criticizing. Uh, they they kneel at the beginning of every Premier League football match uh, here, in, uh, not here in the UK now. Yeah, I was like mm -hmm. I was saying that is following. But what Kaepernick did, that's leadership, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. When everyone else is standing up and you kneel down, right? And he took, uh, you know, uh, he made a big sacrifice when he did that. I'm sa I'm saying that's the type of stuff I'm looking for. That's what I respect. That's what I admire. Not just. You know, these Premier League players, I'm, I'm not actually criticizing them, but I'm saying how fake it seems that they actually have to kneel, right? Because yes, they have to. Yeah, if they don't, <laughs> they'll be slaughtered by the media, right? And also, the organization, the FA, has agreed that all players will kneel, right? So, so it's, it's no different than standing. Yes, mm. exactly. So that's what I'm saying. My point about being sheep. And like you said, Sharif, like people don't like to be called cheap, but there, there needs to come a point where you just, instead of having a, a, a knee jerk uh, emotional reaction when you're being criticized, you need to actually sit back and think, huh, like maybe did I get that right? Did I get that wrong? Right. And I'm, mm -hmm. my whole point about being sheep is that um, I was disappointed that Muslims uh, are not being leaders on things, right? And they're just following, and like some of them, definitely, like what you said, Muhammad, they're just doing it and they don't really know why. And uh, another point that I didn't make in the last episode, which is very pertinent, is just weeks or days or during when George Floyd was killed, um, the media was going mad about coronavirus. Oh, we're all going to die from coronavirus. And somehow now the media's all like, yeah, forget coronavirus, let's all protest. Right. Mm -hmm. So when that 180 degree thing changed, I start getting suspicious. I'm thinking, what's the why is the media so into this? What are they pushing? Right. And, and again, I would apply this to any similar movement, whether it's the Arab Spring, whether it's in Algeria, whether, it's when the everything is aligning in one direction. I start I start poking my head up and trying to see, OK, what's going on here? So um, that's my point about being sheep. If we are standing up against something, against the status quo, that's why I really respect. And, you know, we should be doing it anyway. Um, we, we should right. have been leading the way here as Muslims because, uh, and also maybe I feel I can critique um, the, the, the methods because I actually feel like I, I really truly deep down, I guess I don't feel like it's, oh, black people are doing that and, and non-black people. I actually, I feel like it's, it's my thing as well, my cause as well. Uh, I don't know. It seems like some people feel I'm not welcome because I'm not black or, but we're Muslim, you know, and I think uh, I just that's why I'm spe I speak spoke so openly, uh, uh, feeling like people can can listen and, and I can be be part of it and stuff and talk in a way. But some people don't want to listen just because I'm not uh, black. Um, so that was also a disappointing, to be honest. Um, but yeah, I think what Kaepernick did is the type of action that I would, you know, respect. Um, yes. Because you're, you're putting something on the line, really. 
Um, and and yeah, when the media says something and everything is lining up, the, the, the politicians, the, they, everyone is in one direction, um, something fishy maybe, right? It doesn't mean- yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's really fishy because you got uh, Trump who was totally against Kaepernick and him kneeling. Mm. And you know, he's like, get that son of a, and then, you know, cause you know how he is. Yeah. Uh, about a month ago, they asked him, um, what do you think about, you know, Kaepernick, you know, getting a chance to be in the NFL again? And Trump said, not verbatim, but basically he said, well, you know, um, if, he, if he's got the talent, then I think he should, you know, get a chance. Mm. How do you go from get this, you know, SOB out of here mm. to if he's got the talent, give him a chance? He had the talent then. What happened? I mean, no, because so much political pressure even on Trump, who speaks his mind like a crazy man, yeah. uh, he realizes that the masses are behind this. So yeah. if he wants to get reelected, he has yes. to and also his stance. The, 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 exactly. the, you know, companies, multi, you know, multi-billion dollar companies pick the side. Mm -hmm. And when they pick a side that it aligns with, you know, because they made statements, they had to pick a side. A lot of companies were put, especially on social media, there was mm -hmm. pressure put on them to say, hey, what are you going to do about, like, which, which side are you going to pick on this? Because if you're silent, then you're complicit. But if yes. you're vocal, then you're, you agree with us. Yeah. And suddenly, if you've got like these bulk of, of, of um, organizations and companies picking the side of, you know, supporting uh, mm -hmm. Kaepernick mm -hmm. and the movement, mm -hmm. then Trump also has to think about his pockets. Yeah, <laughs> you know I mean? yeah and, and Nike jumped on Kaepernick. Um, they, you know, it seemed like a risky move to back him and put him on billboards mm -hmm. and stuff. Uh, but really, that is their demographic. The people that are buying their products are people who are going to support Kaepernick. Uh, I'm not, I don't actually, uh, I don't agree with this anti-company uh, thing, um, anti-big billionaire thing. Like, I think what's right is right, what's wrong is wrong, whether you're a billionaire or you're poor, right? Um, but, you know, uh, definitely some uh, big companies are using this uh, to uh, promote themselves, really. Uh, and and uh, I want to be clear as well on this uh, whole follower and sheep thing is that uh, you can you can have like an awakening and realize that this is a bigger issue than you first thought. Um, and then your but your reaction to that knowledge doesn't have to follow the mainstream. Right. So you could become more aware of it and decide to go another way. Right. It doesn't mean you're you're against the movement. You're just choosing to, you know, apply your your insight or your realization in a different way um, so for example one thing i did think was good was i saw um after salat al-jumwa or maybe it was salat al uh, one imam he was giving khutbah and he was standing outside in the street i don't know if there was a protest there or just passers by but he was giving a khutbah about uh i think it was about like uh, justice in islam uh, about how you know racism is not accepted in islam and these are these are non-follower ways to, to work against racism, I think, and do dawah at the same time, you know? So I thought that was interesting uh, way of going about it. Okay, uh, so the next point was just talking about uh, if you put the black screen on their profile, you're following in a sheep. Uh, I, yeah, we spoke about that already, right? So if, you, uh, if you're truly about this, then be about it. Uh, and, you know, if you, again, if you listen to the podcast, you know, I generally just don't like any sheepish mentality, any copying, right? So even if I agreed with it, I wouldn't put a picture, a black thing, just because I don't like following, right? I'll do it my own way. No one has to know Wait, about and, it. And this is it. Like, that's even the discrepancy between you. Like, I got involved in that. So the art and the stuff that I did yes. in, in to, spread, to send that message is because yeah. I've always made stuff to send a message. Do you yes. understand what I mean? Yeah. So like in my graphic design work, I've tried to send it either a spiritual message, a religious message, mm -hmm. and that was top of the conversation. So I created a few things in line with that sort of uh, yeah. thing. So in, in, in my head, I think, well, I'm also part of that. And I think following to a certain extent, you know, this may be where we disagree. Like following to a certain extent is fine. As long as you are aware mm -hmm. that you, this is what you're doing. Yeah, you understand. Yeah, you have to be self-aware yeah. mm. of what, how far, or what you're actively doing, mm. and and that is your the lifestyle. The mission is to mm. do more. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, exactly. But, but what, what there's a difference between being a sheep and mm. uh, using a trend to your advantage. 
Yeah, exactly. And I think you have to be, you have to be self-aware. And this is the key thing. Like it might be that we disagree and that's fine. But the key thing is self-awareness. Like there are people, and I use that example of the person we had earlier Mm. that I was speaking about that we stopped. He wasn't very self-aware. He did it because everyone else was doing it. However, I would argue, and, and anyone can judge me, you know, about this, but when I got involved in whether it was creating the visuals for this sort of um, discussion to be had. Um, I was very self-aware that I'm only, I've only made this now because everybody else is. Mm. And I made quite a few. And I was like, yeah. I only made this now because this is the topic of a conversation. Yeah. Um, and, but then I thought, well, actively, let's, let's be real about this. Actively, what do I do for a living? Do you understand so how can i make a change because i'm in a position where i can make change people's lives mm. um so i thought okay this is something i need to bring back in and then when the topic was brought up in work i had things to say to change people's minds who directly have effect on people's lives especially black people mm. when it comes to mm. you know engagement with law mm. enforcement and stuff like that and people won't see that stuff obviously that you're doing of course you know, it's not course. a social media thing no no of course yeah Okay, uh, being so openly annoyed that so much of the world is finally waking up, and even if it's not completely genuine. Uh, f- finally, more people worldwide are calling out this evil oppression against black people. Uh, there's so many brackets I'm trying. Uh, replace Palestinians, as it will help you understand why, although it would be great if it was all genuine, but why black people are not focusing so much on how ingenuine some people or companies are, because unfortunately oppression needs numbers to gain traction and be acknowledged by fallible humans. So it's literally a time where silence will no longer be tolerated. Either you are against racism or you are not. No, I, th- I think you I don't confl- like binary. I don't like binaries. No, exactly. They're yeah. conflating that. They're conflating that and saying, okay, you either speak up or you're racist. And then they're saying we're openly annoyed, which is an opinion. It's very subjective. It's, if I had said, I'm very annoyed about this Black Lives Matter movement, yeah. fair play however you're you're just basically judging the topic of conversation yeah. and it's a bit insulting to be honest muhammad like again obviously you know they don't know me personally and that's fine i would just ask them to judge me based on what i actually said and rather than assumptions and i think we haven't been given the husn al dhan here we, you know they're not assuming the best uh, very clearly i think i was uh, saying i was disappointed by following people just following mm. that's pretty mm. much what i was saying um uh yeah um saying that black people are having a victim mentality basically saying just get over it it's so easy for you to say i mean barakallah but those who share this privileged view of yours to tell us not to have a victim mentality because again you are not dying because of your skin trust me we don't live our lives as victims and it would be so easy if it was just racism but it's more than racism. It's systematic injustice, unfair treatment, prejudgments, never believed or, be, or given the benefit of the doubt, lack of opportunities, et cetera, et cetera. Long list here, right? Uh, and I'm not downplaying the list. It's just a long list. We know, I think, I'm not going to insult you guys by listing it out. You know it, right? Um, so that's why it's so hurtful to claim that racism is not as bad anymore and that we are having a victim mentality. Yes, 100% slavery is very complex and painful and has existed throughout history across racial groups. However, the reason why black people don't have the opportunity to just get over it is because that legacy of dehumanization and those wide scale systems built on white supremacy and racism are still very well alive and kicking. They affect our lives, not just in America, but around the world. So, I mean, again, uh, Sharif, did we say anything in contrary to this? Now the, the victim mentality, uh, Okay, yes yeah, we did no. say that. Yeah, we did say that. Okay, so <clears throat> um, this isn't uh, like somebody being arrested, but this is about a person being fired from a job. Mm. And I know this person because it's a relative of mine. Okay. And he was like, they just did that because I'm black. Mm. No, they did that because you're lazy and you're not doing your job. Mm. And that's what's best for the company. Mm. People play especially now the race card is very popular to play because nobody wants to say, Oh no, 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 no. Or be accused of being racist. Mm -hmm. So playing the race leverage point. Mm. Oh yeah. Right now it definitely is. Mm. You know, something happens to you. Yeah. It's because I'm black. There is even a white CEO. uh, I read a statement about a month ago and he said, he's scared to speak out. He, he supports, uh, what's happening in everything, 
uh, with Black Lives Matter and their mission, according to what they say, you know, nonviolent, you know, and, and racial equality and all these things. But he says, being that he's white, mm. you know, people say, well, you don't know. Mm. But if he remains silent, why didn't you speak out against it? Yeah. So yeah. he was like, he can't win. Yes. He's just, yeah. he's stuck. Yeah. So many black people, not all of them, but many are playing the victim part. Mm. Um, that, hey, I'm going to use it to my advantage. But the, the racism, yes. Why can't black people get over it? Um, one, they shouldn't get over it because yeah. you've erased the identity of a whole group of people mm -hmm. who they have to say that they're African-American. They can't say they're Italian-American or Chinese-American or Saudi American. No, they're just African-American, a whole continent with different languages, cultures, religions, just food, everything. Mm -hmm. So they shouldn't get over it. Yeah. Um, but something needs to be done to bring back justice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how that is to happen, uh, I don't know yet. Is, yeah. is that something we said they need to get over it? Exactly. This is, this is a, a, I feel, Yanni, I don't like to, again, I don't like to play victim and, and all of that, but this is a lie against, uh, against me, definitely. Like, I didn't say they should get over it. I Cause said, because if you said yeah. that, then I would have called you like that. Exactly. Make sense. Yeah. That, and it, also, <laughs> it's not like me and you are the same person and we agree with each what each other says all uh, the time. Right. Um, but uh, again, this is us being consistent, inshallah, where whenever we talked about in the past Islamophobia, um, when we talked about um, even uh, maybe the issue of uh, the Arab Spring and stuff, we always say that being a victim in your head makes you weak right? Mm -hmm. Makes you weak. We don't believe, you could disagree with this, but we don't agree that uh, being a victim uh, will help you in your struggle to get mm -hmm. justice, right? We, we feel it's actually a disadvantage. It's okay. empower. We talk about empowerment, and this is why, like my running theme has always been: don't beg the oppressor for freedom. Don't yes. beg the or don't beg the oppressor for your rights. He's, yeah. he's still, mm -hmm. you know, if he holds the view, the race. I spoke, I think, about Boris johnson didn't i, I gave an example like yeah. if boris johnson our prime minister is racist and we go to him and say please change this for us yeah. he's still racist yeah you understand yeah. what yeah. i mean and, so, and that's that's such a position of dhul. Uh, what's dhul in english like humiliation mm. right that you're going to and again you know you can say that colonization is not the same as uh, the slave trade and what's happened uh, in, in america that's that's true i accept that uh, but there is similarities there there is uh, parallels there right and again I, I always think to, you know, my experience, of course, that's why I know. And in Algeria, we were colonized for 130 years. And again, it's like imagining that the heroes that we talk about in Algeria, we talk about people that shot the French soldiers, not went to the soldiers and asked them to please leave our country. Or, or you know, uh, even if it was collective protesting saying, you know, leave, leave. Like, they don't think you're human. Like, they don't think you're worth keeping alive you know, mm. uh, and you're asking them to please leave your country. They're like, this is our country. We came, you're lucky we came, we civilized you with this, this, this. And then you're like, please leave, right? In the end, the way, the way that the French left is because some Algerians amongst themselves, they found the pride and the um, dignity and the strength from asking Allah for help to push them, force them out, okay? To force them out. And uh, that's the same approach that I would recommend for anyone right so don't ask for favors force them to give you favors if you know what i mean that's my approach and i apply that across any struggle but see that's not what's happening here and that's one of the criticism uh criticisms because the people who are rioting i'm not saying protesting but the people who are rioting yeah. or just destroying anybody's stuff they're destroying white businesses they actually firebombed my uh cousin's car Mm. And she's black, mm. she's, she's a Muslim, mm. and she has a small baby. Now, how is she supposed to get around? Because these idiots went and firebombed her car when they were out there doing all their craziness. Mm. Mm. Yeah. The example that you gave is that the Algerian people, they fought against soldiers. They had an exact target uh, of oppression. Mm. And we're not going to go out and shoot people, mm. but you can target them where it's going to hurt them the most in the wallet. Mm -hmm. You know, you have black athletes, black entertainers, all these. If, if they just said, you know what, uh, there's going to be no football, no basketball, no baseball season because we're not mm -hmm. playing. 
until these things get resolved. Yeah, mm. yeah. And even you know? uh, to bring it back to the uh, Algerian protests, because I see it all as uh, there's oppression, there's injustice, and how do people approach it and try and get rid of it, right? So when it comes to the Algerian uh, protests, they're asking for like the, pr the president to step down and this and that. What I really thought was good is pressuring the judges, right? Because the judiciary is a very influential um, institution in the government. And if you get them on your side, then that will really, really help you, right? Because the judiciary can put the corrupt politicians in jail, right? When usually they would be, you know, left alone. And they can mm -hmm. stop innocent people from being put in jail. So again, that's like targeted and that's, it's not asking for favors. It's going to a specific group and saying, look, you know, don't you believe in this and this because the judiciary is not like as corrupt as um, other parts of the government or whatever. So yeah, we, uh, you know, I definitely would say, uh, I, I take it actually from, from the Quran directly, right? That Allah commands us. Allah says in uh, Surah Al-Imran, Do not be weak and do not be sad. Do not grieve. Now, if Allah is using the, the, um, imperative he's telling you he's commanding you not to be weak it means that is in your control to not be weak right how is it though but Allah, Allah gives this solution in the end of the ayah he says well, you will be superior you you'll be on the higher ground upper ground in kuntum so therefore i would say the solution is to really build your yaqeen your trust in allah and the uh, practical aqidah or tawheed that you really trust in allah and you believe only good can come and and you stand up for the sake of allah um, and that is, that is one of the solutions. You can't be weak-minded and then be alone, be, have the upper hand, right? And then also the Sahaba, when they were being persecuted um, in Mecca, they came to the Prophet and they said, uh, you know, when will the help of Allah come? You know, won't you ask Allah to help us? And what, again, he didn't allow them to have the victim mindset. He said to them, Imagine, yeah, they're, they, they're, they're hard people, they're tough people, but they got to breaking point. So they went to him and they said, won't you ask Allah to help us? And the Prophet ﷺ, he, he basically told them not to be victims. He said, don't you know there were people before you who uh, they would be, their, the, the skin and flesh would be peeled from them, yeah, with a, with a kind of a fork. It would be peeled from them. And a man would be sawn in two because they believed in Allah, but they didn't turn back on their religion. And then he said, but you don't have enough patience, right? So these days, people might call that victim blaming, right? They're the weak ones in this situation. They're the victims here. And he's saying, you're not patient enough. But really what he's doing is he's giving them, and this is the formula, I think, for success when you're oppressed or you're in a weaker position, is to, um, to actually ask yourself, look, I, yes, I am a victim technically, but I'm going to, what can I do better? Right, put it all on yourself, put the responsibility on yourself. I understand, you know, when you when the the oppression has been on you for generations, I, I actually empathize that that can be difficult, but it doesn't change the fact that this is the the prophetic advice and this is what I think helps in the end, even if it's difficult. Uh, okay. Bringing up counter argument frequently used by the far right that white people can't be proud to be white anymore and can't proudly display their flag. Uh, this is such a hurtful argument because it basically implies that don't talk about oppression of blacks because it's better for us to keep dying than God forbid a white person feel uncomfortable. Secondly, this completely undermines the black struggle because no person ever wants that, uh, etc. So yeah, we, we was that about was that about when I was speaking about my neighbour and how I felt? Yeah, yeah, type of way? exactly, yeah, exactly. That I don't think that was me trying to promote. Or, uh, that was me pointing out a feeling of unease I had in my heart, and I was trying to understand where that came from. That's what it was. So I was trying to uh, dice. Uh, what's the word? Dissect my own sort of. Uh, I'd, I'd call it prejudice. Yeah, I said I was trying to dissect my own prejudice because. I have now, I'm conditioned to see the St. George's flag, the white flag with the red cross mm. and feel like it's a racist flag mm. when it's really yeah. in a vacuum. Well, I don't know about a vacuum, but really it's the, the country's flag, mm. you know? Now it's different from like, it's, it's almost like saying an American flag, the US flag and being like, oh, that's a bit. However, if you saw the Confederate flag, and that's a different story because that is, that's loaded. 
Mm. You know, that's a loaded flag with a loaded meaning. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this is what that's what I was trying yeah. to, to I get. I think what you, what we are trying to say is that, of course, we are, we agree with the 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 cause of uh, equality, of, of racial um, equality and justice. We agree with that. We were just saying that when it's done in the wrong way, what you get is is an extreme, which is mm -hmm. what certain people are complaining of, which is that they feel, you know, we can't be white anymore. Now, just on a purely uh, objective, like strategic point of view, if you're in a country which is majority white and you have a cause, any cause, and the white people are not on your side at all, and you've alienated them, how likely are you that you're going to succeed with that cause? You know, mm -hmm. you've got to get them on your side somehow. And you don't do that by going so extreme that you alienate them. Right. It doesn't mean you, you don't do the cause, do the cause. Yeah. Um, but just don't but, go extreme. And you don't, you just, you don't want to become that which you despise and that's which mm. oppressed you. Yeah. Um, you know, look at, okay, look at Zionism today. Mm. Like that's just, I'm not saying, I'm not saying in any way, shape or form that that is what's happening today in terms of um, those who have suffered for racism for a generation that they're now suddenly racist. I'm not saying that. I'm saying be aware of the hallmarks that could lead to that in the future. You don't want that. Mm. You, know? you don't right. want it to be so casual that you can just make fun of white people because then you haven't got the equality there. Then you become that which you despise in the first place. Yeah. You know? And that's why I said, when the question was posed, to, we spoke about this, we discussed with each other, when have you ever been racist? Like, me and you. Yeah. And I said, you know what? I identified that actually I've probably been racist towards white people because mm -hmm. it wasn't until I married someone who was half white and I became in a white family that I became very conscious of some of the stuff we say in terms of taking the mick, right? I'd be like, oh, that's a, you know, that's a white thing or whatever. Yeah. And I was like, oh, now I've just realized I've, I'm becoming exactly what I hated. Mm -hmm. the, the behavior, the element behavior, forget who's doing it, the behavior mm -hmm. of racism. Mm. I've, I've, I've validated it because I believed I was a victim of it previously. So I've got every right. So, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Just because you were, you were a victim of it, it doesn't give you the free car to, to, you know, two wrongs don't make a right, essentially. That's ultimately one. Yeah, yeah. And that doesn't take away from the fact that we agree with the cause, you know. Of course. Again, of it's course. not, it's uh, more nuanced than that. Um, mm. Then this one's written in capitals. And this is the second last one. Discussing whether one of the most derogatory racist words the N-word, arguing that it is not actually always racist. This was said clearly by Amin, uh, bearing in mind that there is a derogatory word for black people in nearly every language. Mm. So um, from my memory, I when said I that. said that, I was saying that there are different areas that we could um, uh, focus our efforts, right? You could focus it there, uh, or you could focus it uh, on, on those kind of elements where people are using that word against someone, or you could focus it on I don't know, um, police brutality, or you could focus it on the actual uh, in prison industrial complex, for example, yeah? These are three areas. I was saying there are different places you can cut your efforts. Um, so that's what I, I was actually saying. I, I don't, if you ask me, uh, is it always racist? I, I don't I don't know. I, I can't answer that question. So, no, it's not. Okay. So, <laughs> black people use it themselves. Yeah. So um, what, but what, they, if, what if a non-black person says it, you know? It depends on what non-black person says it. Yes. And how they say it. Yeah. So. Uh, and by the yeah. way, Sharif, just, I'll, I'll let you go on, on now. But what you've just said is what I've heard from uh, two people. Yeah. From Mufti and from mm -hmm. uh, Immol Technique. Yeah. So anyway, okay. uh, that's kind of maybe where, where I heard it from anyway. But I, I don't have that opinion because I... I I actually don't, in this case, I don't have an opinion. I, maybe I'm not qualified to have an opinion. Anyway, go ahead. So they're going to get into a bunch of everything. So historically, we know that it is a racist term. And if you look at the languages came from, so you take, you know, nigger, then you go back to uh, negro, then you go back to negro into Spanish, then you go back into Latin to necro, meaning dead talking about that the, the black person was mentally inferior and mentally dead. Mm. Uh, so you have that historical context. Now, mm. people who were called this and then like the rap culture just say, you know what, we're gonna change it. Mm. And it's gonna be nigga mm. with an A mm. as a term of endearment, you know, between, you know, people. Mm. And you see, uh, you can just go on YouTube 
you'll see Snoop Dogg, David Chappelle, Kevin Hart um, using the word. As a matter of fact, they roasted, uh, Snoop Dogg roasted Justin Bieber. And he was like, that's my nigga, mm. right? So he's saying it there. Now, if somebody who has a touch of black in their ancestry, like Puerto Ricans, Puerto Ricans are Spanish, black, and Taino Indians. Mm. They identify as black. Mm. Even one of the most uh, famous Puerto Ricans, you know, Ricky Martin, you know, he identifies as black. He says his grandfather is black. Mm. Um, and if they're in the, the company of black people that they grew up with and they use it, it wouldn't be considered offensive. Mm. Mm -hmm. Now, if a white person were to use the term mm. and they didn't grow up, mm amongst black people uh, or in the rap culture and all these things, mm. they're probably gonna get beat down. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Without a doubt. Mm. Yeah. So it's used as a term of endearment mm. amongst people within the black culture. Yeah. But yeah. even some black people are like, no, no, no. Have some self-respect mm. because you can't take something that was negative and make it positive. Come up with yeah. a new term. What do you think? <sighs> It's, uh, man, it's, it's difficult mm. because, uh, yes, I, I think that ER is definitely a racist term without a doubt, mm. but then with an A, I know how the people use it and language is something that evolves. Mm. So if it means something of endearment now, mm. then people who use it as a term of endearment, then. I guess they have that particular right. Mm. Just like you take any English word, um, uh, nice, nice in English, yeah. right? So caring and everything like that. Mm. But if you look historically, nice has to do with mental, like he's nice, like something's wrong with him mentally. Mm. Okay. Mm. Yeah. So we have to accept what it means now. We can't just re lie on an old definition yeah yeah so it's see. it's a it's a gray area i don't know mm -hmm. why someone who clearly is very versed in, you know from this email very versed in the issues at hand would pick out one of the most one of the most obvious things that is that that has different perspectives on it such as the n-word because it's very clear it's very mm -hmm. clear that there's mixed usage yeah everybody knows that you know but to I the point where saying that I can't question it because I'm not black, basically. No, but what we're Even pointing though, out is there's yeah. a fact that there is different values or different understandings and intentions attached to it. Yeah, and that's yeah. known. That's known to the yeah. point where you've got you've got people that aren't black singing along with uh, black rapper songs, you know, uh, that use the N word in their verses, and then they have to say la 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 la, la and then they just they go silent at the N word, and then they carry on singing with it because they don't know whether they should or shouldn't say it. I think by the fact that they purchase, you know, they're consumers of this material. Th there was a rapper who brought someone on stage and to oh, sing no. a verse. Oh God. And I guess, I don't know if they're clueless or, or I don't know, but they just said the verse the way he said the verse. And then yeah. he's like, no, 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 you don't get it. You don't say that word. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously the person on the stage was not black. And so they tried it again and they said it again. And he's like, look, you don't get this. Like, just go. But that was a really. Uh, yeah. I don't agree with. I don't agree with that because being monitored by everything and everybody, uh, and you know, even the two of you, you you just kept saying the N word, the N word. Okay. Yeah. Now you could have just said, you know, people are saying, you know, it's not right to say nigger. Why not just say it? Because. We don't say in America, we don't say the S, S word, a derogatory term for Hispanics. We don't say, oh, mm -hmm. the S word, instead of saying, oh, he called him a spick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or if somebody's like Chinese, oh, we don't say the C word, he called him a chink. Mm -hmm. Just, I don't believe in this over, you know, policing of words. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not saying to call people these things, but when yeah. you're talking about it, you know, you can just say, well, calling somebody this, this, and this, and this is not acceptable. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. why is it that we just single out the N, the N word? You can't say the word. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so, I suppose that's it, and that's the that's the pressure that is upon those who don't have the the right to discuss that. You know, the right to talk about that linguistically because I am actively like you just mentioned I am actually aware that when I was about to say it I was like well I always say the n-word so let me say the n-word but then I was quite conscious of the fact that we're discussing this in a critic you know a critical way um, but at the same time the I think it's fair enough to err on on safety so, here because yeah. even when you know we recorded the last episode we didn't really don't want to upset anyone um, if we said something that we believe is true and we very confident, you know, we have no, you know, uh, we're not being racist here. We're not against the actual cause itself. Um, if that happens to upset people, so be it, right? Because the truth is more important than people's feelings, but I will never go out of my way to, you know, upset people, you know? Mm. Okay. Last point. I would never downplay yours or anyone else's experiences of Islamophobia. May Allah preserve you both and your families. I mean, but you, you being a Muslim does not qualify you to speak on the black experience. Barakallahu feekum. I mean, made this argument because yes, it's not the oppression Olympics, but systematic racism and white supremacy across the world will never affect you as much as it will a black person or a black Muslim. No, I got to just stop you, bro. You have every right and you are compelled to speak about it because you're a Muslim. We stand for truth. Mm. I don't care if you're a Chinese Muslim, Arab Muslim, white Muslim, you know, whatever, black Muslim. Mm. If you hear something, we have to speak about it. Yeah, mm. even if, and this is the thing, um, Sharif, is that if we did an episode, yeah, two non-black people, and we agreed with this sister or anyone who's critiquing it, that would actually be fine. Now we are allowed to speak about it. But it's only when we're disagreeing with their view that, okay, now we're not allowed to speak about it, you know? And that is, for me, that's, you gotta hit a hard, you know, handbrake there and just stop right where you are and just be very careful about what you're saying it, is that we're not allowed to question things basically. That's what, that's what is being said here. And that's very dangerous, um, especially us Muslims, you know, we need to, uh, we need to be wise. We need to think and we need to accept in the end, look, uh, this is not, I would hope anything like this, it's not about people. It's not about, it's just about ideas. And so if my ideas are wrong, then correct the ideas. My ideas can't be wrong just because of the color of my skin or uh, vice versa, you know? So, um, sure, the, umma, I, the umma is one body, isn't it? And that's, that's yeah. not, but that's what not... she's saying is, yes, it's one body, but you guys don't get it. And I would, I would agree that of course I don't get it, but I'm, it doesn't make what I'm saying wrong just because I don't get it. Like, show me the missing information I have that makes my ideas wrong. You know, show what's this missing information, you know? And uh, again, you, uh, she, she can't speak for black people as well, you know? Uh, it's, it's people have different ideas and let's discuss ideas rather than people and, you know, who they are, you know? Um, and to further prove that, you know, again, I, uh, Sharif listened to the episode and he's like, I, I agree with everything. Right. Oh, so Sharif's not black now. Yeah, <laughs> that's not. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. I don't want uh, uh, this is I hope there isn't any more fallout from this because I think we've explained it. No, there will be. I don't be, want, I don't want be Muhammad, right? No, but in but, terms of Sharif, Sharif yourself, I don't want you. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to get the fall. It's OK. Because... <laughs> but I don't want that. To, that's not because, hey, if we care about validating the black experience, mm. we can't just invalidate. A, a, an experience of, of black people that don't agree with the majority or don't agree like that's not that yeah. doesn't do you understand what I'm trying to say mm. like yes. yeah it doesn't make sense because yeah. for example we talked about like uh, people taking a knee yeah mm -hmm. okay um, the person who told Colin Kaepernick to take a knee mm. was a veteran US military oh. he saw him sitting down and he contact they contacted each other they talked and he said you know I'm protesting and he, he said, is there another way that you can protest? Because a lot of people have died, you know, in defense of the flag. He says, what we do in the military, that we kneel. So I don't know if you've ever seen, they uh, make a, like a, a memorial, they'll take a rifle with a okay. bayonet and it goes in and they put mm. the boots there, the dog tags and the helmet mm. and they'll kneel and they might pray. Mm or they do the same thing with a flag. He said, mm. is there another way you can protest? Mm. So they agreed upon kneeling, mm. he said, as a respectful way to protest. Standing, for those who stand, is a respectful way 
of honoring the flag. Right. So, yeah, there's just a, a lot of confusion uh, going on right now. And I think that people's emotions mm. are getting the best of them. They're not really taking enough time to uh, reflect on what's happening and a plan to go forward. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the, I think that's the, the big problem. Uh, black people, white people, everybody, they just, mm. they're in the deep end of the pool and they can't swim and they're just mm. trying to figure it out. Yeah, yeah. And and honestly, like, we can appreciate that, right? Like, uh, you know, I'm making mistakes every day and stuff, and that's fine. But try not to throw that at other people and try and make, you know, call other people names or whatever, because you are struggling to explain what's wrong with what I said, right? So, um, yeah, so I appreciate that the people might have been hurt. Um, but I think like, like I do, uh, actually, I wanted to give this example, right? And again, you know, oh, because I'm not black, I can't speak. And I'm trying to give other examples. I really do think the similarities here. But anyway, when I uh, heard of this, um, this common thing that especially amongst uh, right wingers in, in Europe and stuff, even America, they talk about this um, anti-immigration people. They talk about the uh, Arab refugees who are moving into Europe, into Germany and, and Sweden and stuff. And there's actually been apparently groups of um, Arab men who are raping women, you know, the local women. Okay. Um, now this, what, when I first heard about this, I, I guess I, I dismissed it or I was probably exaggerated or something like that uh, because of who it's coming from. But then my second thought was, well, I mean, it is possible, right? Like if it's, if it's true, it's true. Like whether it hurt me or not, like it obviously disappoints me to hear that Muslims are doing this. Right. Um, and Muslims and Arabs, whatever, I, I guess I identify more as Muslim, but I am Arab as well. Um, so it, it, it upsets me, it disappoints me when I hear that, but that doesn't change the fact that it's either being done or not being done. So then I try and put my emotions aside and I try and find out, okay, is it actually happening or, happening or not, right? And just because it's coming from these anti-immigration people, it doesn't mean it's a lie. And just because it's coming from whatever other group of people, it doesn't mean it's truthful, right? Mm -hmm. So it's about focusing on the facts, the reality, what's really happening. And, uh, and like, as a being open to a being cr criticized, right? So Muslims are being criticized all the time. Um, within, within us as an ummah, we criticize each other a lot, you know, different groups and your way is wrong. And, and the, the, I just think it's really strong. It's really powerful to critique ourselves, right? Not mm -hmm. the other group or the other race or the other, but critique yourself. Look at yourself and say, you know, uh, that guy, okay, oh, I found out actually, yes, there are groups of Arabs who are raping women. Okay, what did I do to cause that? Now, that's a very like hard thing to ask yourself and a deep question. Um, I remember thinking about even when it comes to Syria and, and people, so many people suffering, it's like, how did I contribute to this? Because uh, as we know, our sins actually do reflect on what happens in the world, right? Mm. And so... I think that's genuinely just a powerful way of making change is always asking yourself, uh, how could I, how did I contribute to, to this and how can I do things better? Um, and yes, it is, it's very difficult, but I just think it's, it's the, it's the way out. Okay. Now uh, there was other comments and there were positive, uh, emails, but we, we've spoken a long time. So I just wanted to kind of close with some of the, uh, maybe focus on, because I, I like the attitude of Malcolm X, right? Like I, I, when I read his autobiography, I thought this is, I like this mindset, right? This is like an empowered mindset, a mindset of even I remember when he was in Nation of Islam, he wouldn't work, he wouldn't take help from white people. He's like, we've got to do it ourselves. We've got to be strong ourselves, right? And um, so I just want to talk a little bit about that um, because I think there are some elements there that's definitely positive. Um, so maybe Sharif, you can help me here, but why I understood is the nation of Islam, one of the really real positive parts of, of that movement was that uh, they were all about independence and strengthening themselves. So they didn't have to go and get help from others. So they were all about uh, buying and selling from each other, uh, business oriented, um, really helping each other community wise, uh, helping people rid themselves of the ills that mess with you like drugs and alcohol abuse and stuff like that and really getting people out of crime and getting them into legit ways of making money and stuff um so you know i think that's really really powerful way forward and it goes in line with my general 
uh, belief and understanding that working ground up is the way to go. So that's why you have to critique yourself because if you critique the people at the top, you can't control them, but you can control yourself. So, you know, do you know anything more other than the, the little bits I just said about in terms of the movement and uh, how they made progress? Well, there are two other things that they had. They had their own schools. Mm. So Sister Claire Muhammad schools um, are still in existence today. Um, and their, their teachings have changed, alhamdulillah. Um, they've come over to, you know, Quran and Sunnah, uh, oh. from my understanding. Mm. Um, but yeah, they felt like, you know, why are we going to, in their terms, send our children to the white man to learn his history and lie to us about our history. So they yeah. established their own schools. Yeah. They also established their own farms, mm. you know, because people got to eat mm. and they didn't want to be dependent upon others. Mm. Um, today, these things are very few. I mean, they sold off all kinds of property and things like that. But um, I just recently saw a meme that goes in line with this. It said, um, we're fighting to get a seat at their table mm. instead of establishing our own table. Mm. Yeah. You know, I love, yeah. and I want to be clear because people are like this guy, I'm not a separatist, you know, I'm not saying that, you know, black people just need to remove themselves from society or Muslims need to remove themselves. Marcus from society. Garvey. Yeah. No, no Marcus Garvey or Drew Ali or anything like that. I'm saying that, you have to take care of yourself, you know? Um, and those people who are most like you are those that you take care of. Your family is first. So you take care of your family, mm -hmm. then your other relatives, uh, your community. Mm -hmm. Most likely in this situation, it's gonna be a black community because of where, you know, uh, everybody's living. And then it spirals out. This isn't uh, something of separation or segregation. I believe even on a national scale that, you know, once the local areas get, you know, better situated, they take care of themselves, goes to the state, goes to the nation. Uh, and I'm going to go out even further. Um, people are going to get you, but I'm, I'm sorry that uh, I'm, I'm against all this foreign aid going out to countries. Mm. Um, the biggest receiver of U.S. foreign aid is Israel. Mm. Everybody is always happy to say that. Mm. The second biggest receiver of U.S. foreign aid is Egypt, mm -hmm. right. you know? Mm -hmm. So how many homeless people do we have in the U.S.? How many hungry people, how many working hungry people do we have? Mm. So the nation, in a sense, was doing it on the small scale of, hey, we got people here in our community that don't have food. We got women who can't educate their children or don't have whatever. So they, they took care of their own first. And I think we need to get back to that mindset, uh, being black, Muslim, or whomever, but not totally cut off the outside society, other people, but you have to establish yourself first. Mm -hmm. Because as we know, in Islam, the hand on the top is better than the hand on the bottom. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah, definitely. And the, the strong Muslim is more beloved to Allah than the weak Muslim. Um, mm -hmm. When, when it comes to, uh, I guess what I was trying to say, I don't know if it was understood clearly or not in the last episode, was uh, the way I think to, to fight uh, racism is very, very much on the, on the ground level. And that's where it requires, like what I was say, saying about like Kaepernick, how he was standing against the status quo. So I think it's very much about those difficult, you know, times when, you know, your cousin says, you know, X word or, you know, makes X um stereotype or generalization it's about those uncomfortable confrontations where you've got to uh st speak up basically right mm -hmm. that's a big area i think uh, we can make serious change right um and then that that then goes on to if you're at a company you're working at a place again with your colleagues confronting your colleagues confronting your manager even even if it means job insecurity because yes we have to stand up uh, for justice um you know it doesn't mean you have to always always be bringing things up but you need to bring it up you know it's like our duty kind of thing and i think that's where a lot of the work will happen a lot of the change will happen uh, i'm not an expert on how things change and stuff but uh just observing different changes that happen throughout history and even some of my teachers have, have said this is the conclusion they've come to as well is that change really does happen on the on the bottom up a lot of the time mm -hmm. um 
any other ideas on Yanni how uh, like uh, uh, other ways we can basically I mean uh, f- fund fund fundamentally um education is key and the, the the number one thing is i echo what malcolm x said was that how is he his view was that islam was the solution to racism in america mm. and and when we say that we know that muslims can be racist i'm not mm. saying that muslims are the solution to racism but islam as is truly practiced so number one all muslims all muslims need to practice their deen to the best of their ability and be very conscious about the far reaching effects that they as an individual have you know everyone is has a responsibility to to display this beautiful religion as the solution to the world's problems and the second thing that isn't you know isn't as strong as that because islam is the 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 main thing however the second thing is the constant and consistent education of history world history mm. not an isolated a few years etc and then that's it you're done you've done your history now mm. we're talking about consistent education of history throughout um you know of the world the entire world you know and I, 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 i've dabbled into it now and it's only now that i've started studying you know history uh recreationally you know outside mm. of school mm. and now i'm picking and choosing what i can look into that i'm absolutely fascinated and blown away about the things i never knew you know mm. and and it humbled me it humbled me because we live in a status quo of white supremacy you know youth european colonizers or you know america uh, mil- mil- american military bases across the world and we think that's the status quo that's what it's always been and anything that is media related in terms of talking about history oh well we had the romans and we had the ancient greeks and uh, we borrow their culture you know it's the same thing the greek culture is what the romans borrowed and the roman culture is what we've borrowed you know, even buildings, even in legislation, even even in the naming of of extraterrestrial bodies in the sky, we borrow that culture. We borrow that culture, and it and it permeates through. Mm. But let's ignore everything else. Let's ignore the diversity of history and the diversity of the world and the ups and downs and the dark ages that Europe was living in, whilst other populations of what we consider ethnic minorities here were the powerhouses of the world at the time. Um, so yeah, those are the two. Those are the two. It's the full deep understanding and practicing of Islam and ridding the problem in our homes. And when I say homes, I'm not just talking about that, our roofs, but we talk about our masajid, our communities. Um, and naturally, I think Allah has blessed us with an incredible opportunity because we wouldn't be living in such mixed environments if mm. the status quo had, had remained how it was before, where, you know, all the Arabs were in Arabia, you know, and, and and all the black people in uh, I don't know Africa, for example, or whatever you want to, whatever demographic you want to focus on, and all the Chinese people were in Asia, etc., etc., etc. We are now have true opportunity to show the unity of Islam because you can walk into a masjid and have all sorts of backgrounds in there that you may have not actually been able to see on the same scale when uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was, was, was alive. You had, you know, the, the Muhajirun and Ansar, but ultimately they were all the same ethnic background. So to any outsider, you know, to a, to a Christian from Abyssinia, looking at that, they'd be like, well, they're all Arabs, why can't they get along? Mm. You know, they're all from the desert, they're all from the same mm. locale, why can't they get along, mm. you know? Mm. But no, we have an opportunity now Let's mm. empower ourselves. We have an opportunity to show the world. Look at come come into our mission. Look at look at these people eating together. Look at these people. You know, um, I know we always go to marriage, and I hate using that as such an <laughs> example all the time. But you understand what I'm trying to say. Like, yeah. marriage is such a deep thing. Yeah. Like, I'm you are now part of my family. That's why I think we go mm. to it as such a. You yeah. are now. You know, as mm. me as a as a, a father. You know, mm. I've got two sons, alhamdulillah. And if one day they decided to marry someone completely different race, I would say to that, 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 that woman, you are my daughter now. Like, forget this, this thing. You are my daughter now, in the sense. Mm. And that's the most powerful, you know, anti-racist thing you could, you could go towards, I think, mm. anyway. Allah, mm. Allah knows best. No, no, yeah. Alhamdulillah, that's a good one. I like that because when I'm in the UK, inshallah, I'll be there next week. Yeah. And um, when I'm walking with my mother-in-law, yeah. And, you know, people see her and they see me, they're like, because she was questioned about it before because, you know, she's white British with blue eyes. Mm. You know, my, my wife is biracial. I was like, they, they asked her before, like, uh, who's that guy you're yeah. walking with? Mm. Oh, that's my son-in-law. And she yeah, gets yeah. all happy. So, yeah, you know, exactly. the family, you know, people coming together that probably would yeah. have never 
mm. you know, been together. And powerful, these, powerful. these days we're in Dhul Hijjah. And it reminds me when I was in Hajj, you know, you go and you see people all over the world. I remember I was in uh, Masjid and Nabawi last year. And, um, you know, I walk out and uh, these uh, Sudanese, they invite me to sit with them. I sit with them. I have tea. We sit with the Sudan. Obviously, I can speak to them because they're, they're speaking Arabic. But then a uh, brother from uh, Senegal comes, or a couple of them, they come, right? And he can't really speak Arabic. They're just trying to like understand, oh, where are you from? All oh, this, all oh, this, you know? So uh, that's a really good uh, example of, uh, yeah. it, it's funny because, I mean, I don't know. I guess there is racism at Hajj, but you really feel like uh, it is a lot of unity there, alhamdulillah. Mm. And I guess it's mm. a, it's a, uh, example it's, it's, of what we can do i guess it's an opportunity we're blessed with that even mm. majority muslim countries don't necessarily have this opportunity because they generally tend to be from uh, one predominant demographic however you go into any muslim masjid in the in the west and you've got all sorts of shapes sizes colors and complexions yeah. and we are I mean, not so much you anymore, I mean, because you've you're not in the West anymore. <laughs> but you know what I'm trying to say, like we are at the forefront of Dawah, really and truthfully. We are engaged in people's lives. We are dealing with people every day. And if you want to be part of a movement that promotes equality and anti racism, then take the responsibility and be Muslim about it. Because truly protesting and lobbying and writing and all these other options that you have are not as deeply rooted in the truth that Allah has placed in us because this is this religion isn't the Arab religion. This is the son of Adam. This is for the son of Adam. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator, dictated it. These are the rules and regulations that the mm. insan must abide by to, mm. to prosper on this on this world. Mm. That's ultimately yeah. the solution. I wanted to share a, a, a concept from a, an Algerian thinker, Malik bin Nabi, and he was criticized heavily for this idea that he brought forward. Um, but I think it, it applies here. It's interesting to think of. So his, uh, he was alive, you know, uh, yani after uh, Algerian independence. Okay. So obviously that was a time when uh, Algeria got its so-called independence. I mean, <laughs> technically it's not really a thing, but um, and, you know, this is when you would hope that now the shackles are gone, you know, let's develop. But it didn't quite happen like that. But what he said was he was uh, trying to uh, bring the, the Muslim world out of its current state of indignity and uselessness. And his philosophy was founded on the ayah, Inna Allah, la ma bi qawmin hatta ma bi anfusim. Allah won't change uh, what's in a people until they change what's in uh, themselves. So to fulfill this mission, he set out to understand the factors that cause civilizational rise and fall. His theory was that at any given time, a society prioritizes things, uh, personalities or ideas, okay? And sometimes there's an overlap. When a society is not prioritizing ideas and putting things and personalities in the service of ideas, it will fall into weakness because the idea loses its power. For Muslim uh, societies, the idea that you should be prioritizing is Islam. So he had this concept of colonizability, right? And so there's very... Uh, controversial uh, at least then which is that uh, we were colonized because we were colonizable right so he's kind of putting the blame on us because when you put the blame on yourself then you can fix it and he was saying that the way that we became weak is that we stopped giving uh, preference and priority to ideas and in, the, in our case it's Islam and we started putting more uh, focus on things and people yeah mm -hmm. and so because of that we became weak and we became colonizable so he's saying now that we've got rid of the, uh, we've got rid of the, uh, you know, colonizer, uh, we need to actually get out of the mindset of being colonizable in the first place. And I think, uh, unfortunately, we still, we still see this today, right? Like, for example, <laughs> I was talking to somebody who wants to start a uh, private school in Pakistan. He's Pakistani. And he said, oh, if I just get a white principal, I'll fill up that school. Everyone want to go there. So again, this is a type of racism as well. And it's kind of inferiority complex where we don't, you know, value ideas and we don't value ourselves and our own ideas, right? So uh, I thought that was interesting because people criticize him so much. And he's kind of saying what we're saying here, where it's like, put the responsibility on yourself and focus on what you can do, what, how you can change. Because in Allah, la ma bi qawmin hatta ma bi anfusihim. So yeah, this has been a long episode. I think it's longest episode, Muhammad, right? Yeah. I'm sorry, brother Sherry. 
<laughs> We've dragged you into this mess. <laughs> no problem. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Any Glad closing uh, remarks? Yes. Um, it's completely off topic. Okay. But Brother Sharif has just started his YouTube channel. Which yes. I was, I was going to ask him to, to, uh, to do one because it was absolutely fundamental that he do that after his amazing episode with us previously. And I know mm. people were, people did message me asking for your social media and stuff. Didn't think you had any, but the fact that you've done the YouTube channel. Oh, so what is it, brother? Do you want to speak about it a little bit? Well, the, uh, the channel is the Muslim homesteader. Uh, basically on this channel, I'm going to educate people, answer questions and tell them about the homesteading journey. Um, this channel is geared towards Muslims. I mean, if you go online, you'll see there's a bunch of, you know, channels and there's going to be like music and women running around in shorts and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And if you want to learn about homesteading, that's one of the few choices that you have besides books. Mm -hmm. But my channel is uh, Islamically compliant, inshallah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. there's no background music. There's no uh, women that are uncovered. I got to make this clear because I, I made a mistake on my first video. I said, like, there's no women. <laughs> and I meant, I meant to say there's no uncovered women okay. uh, because, you know, my wife and daughters and, you know, uh, the neighbors and they'll be in the, the videos. Um, but yeah, we just want to try to educate the people. If they have questions, they can send their questions to the Muslim homesteader at gmail.com. Mm -hmm. um, I'll be putting out uh, videos pretty much daily because I'll just take the questions that come in okay. and just like answer a question a day. Okay. Um, and I'll keep the videos short. I'm not going to be like marathon people like you guys. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> <Right>. Yeah. <laughs> so like uh, 10 minute Tuesdays and like 15 minute Fridays. Um, Love it. And I'll, I'll take people on tours mm -hmm. of uh, what's going on here. And I, I'm very clear about my site. Um, if you're looking for, a site that's perfect, beautifully manicured. This isn't the site. I'm going to show you the reality. Yeah. Because yeah, uh, yeah. I got stuff piled up like, yeah. in different places. But that's that's a real view of how things are. You're, you're working. You'll say, I'll get this later next week, turns into next month. Mm. Uh, and I want people to understand that anybody can do it. I don't care if you live in an apartment, mm. flat for the UK, you know, people. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, but you can homestead. There's different levels of homesteading. And this is what the channel is going to cover. So please check it out. Mm. It's the Muslim Homesteader mm. oh. channel. And we'll put the link yes. of that in the description, inshallah. So you can just inshallah. click there. Click there and go straight and just press subscribe and then check the video out, inshallah. <laughs> I'm uh, so yes, excited, man. I'm uh, so excited. So, uh, it'll be really good, inshallah. <laughs> and uh, definitely, if you... Uh, this is obviously not the first time I had Sharif on. So definitely listen to episode 79. That was the other one where Sharif came and he talked about homesteading, uh, living the, the farm life, moving from, you know, living more of an urban lifestyle uh, to that. Uh, it, yeah, I think, I think hands down Sharif is the best episode. Um, so Jazakallah yeah, khairan for that. Um, yeah, we'll close this out. I just want to say that, Alhamdulillah, we try to be uh, an open platform here where a lot of the big podcasts, you can't send them your concerns or your criticisms. But inshallah, here we try to, uh, yes, offer alternative opinions um, because the, often our minds are too stagnant. We need some fresh ideas, new ideas. And also we're open to being wrong, right? And so I think a couple of times I, I, I mentioned that the last episode, maybe I was a bit insensitive. Yes. Um, so I will put my hands up for that. Um, but inshallah, what we try and do is deal with ideas and facts here uh, rather than just uh, uh, you know emotions right so uh thanks everyone anyway for your input and uh yeah it's been a really good uh, episode jazakum Allah khairan and uh, thanks sharif sorry for the long uh, time <laughs> but uh, yeah uh, we'll end it there inshallah uh, again you can give us uh, feedback uh, again on uh, where do you go? Mindheistpodcast.com. So uh, the, you can uh, contact us anonymously or via email there. And uh, yeah, we'll leave it there, inshallah. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Shadu wa na'ilal anta. Astaghfirullah wa atubu alayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.